Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texas Radio. Billy Lucci here on Texas Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men. We will graduate players. And we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as clear a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had <laughs> no other option but one hand at yeah, that point. Yeah, man, right? 50-50 ball, I got to come down with You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. I'm not going to say who texted me, but somebody texted me. He's like, buddy, you need spring football to start right now because uh, Aggie Hoops, premature ending to the season last night, some people believe. I'm not ready to go there just yet, but the numbers to get them in, OB as he's crunching them right now, going to be a little difficult. Welcome into Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, Go Hour presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. Today is Wednesday, February 21st, 2024. David Nuno. Olin Buchanan, that basketball game sucked. Um, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. When you go <clears throat> ten and a half minutes, more than more than a, a quarter of the game without a field goal. I think we've said this before this year too. I don't know if it's has it ever gotten to ten and a half minutes. I think though. it's been ten minutes. I, I remember that exact quote of a whole quarter without scoring. I think it was ten minutes and twenty three seconds to be exact mm-hmm. between. Uh, I think they were uh, between Jace Carter three pointers. Yeah, or maybe one wasn't three pointers, just a basket. But between Jace Carter baskets and um, they were at one stretch one of sixteen. I looked down on the stats, and at one point in the uh, second half, their second half shooting percentage was like eleven percent. It just felt like they weren't ever going to score again, and they became so. I don't even want to say one-dimensional. They became no-dimensional, right? There was no dimension because they were physical with Wade. Basically, what they were said is, I don't care who has the ball. If it's between those two guys, they're going to see two or three guys. We're going to make other people beat us, and we're going to be physical with Wade. Yeah, and and A&M is if you can take Wade and and Boots out of the game or even even, uh, contain them to some degree – and put put it on the other guys. A and M's just not consistent enough at other positions to to be able to score with them. Um, and you know it's funny because it's not funny, but I'd see Wade early in the game and he'd try to drive and he'd have one guy on him, you know, probably their best defender. But every time he looked like he might be starting to get, you know, uh, make a move toward the basket, big old uh, Makai Mitchell would step in. What a game he had, man. Uh, he he is a problem for AM. And I think every team with a uh with a talented big man is gonna give A and M trouble because he can protect the rim. A and M made something like eight of twenty three what statistically is considered layups. They missed a lot of shots at the rim. And a big part of that uh was if they didn't get them blocked by Mitchell, I think he affected shots. So yeah. um it was it was a it was a disaster all the way around. Yeah, look, here, here's a real problem. In two out of their last three losses, they've lost three in a row. Two of their last three losses, teams have been the more physical team, the more active team. Vanderbilt did a lot of what A&M likes to do. Mm-hmm. I think Arkansas did a lot of what oh, A&M yeah, likes absolutely. to do. And, and that just can't happen at this point in the season. And I don't know what it is. Like, if – if, if you make them so non-dimensional scoring-wise, and they're, this is a team that already struggles sometimes to score, but you take away that option, then they're like, it, you know, it's actually a miracle that they had a chance at the end is the way I feel. Uh, yeah, you know, um, <laughs> that's what I was kind of writing about last night is somehow, despite all the, what I thought was the worst half of basketball I've seen this year, they were down three 
With two twenty, they were down that? three with two forty four and uh, and Wade Taylor at the foul line and Wade's usually automatic. I'm already saying, hey, it's a two point game. Well, he misses it. That doesn't happen. But what does happen is Anderson Garcia came in and swatted the rebound out to Boots for a three point. Hey, he's shooting a three pointer to tie. Nope. And he misses it. Uh, and then what happens on the other? And end? then you know they go down and hit a four point play, and it's Tremont Mark, the guy that. Of beats course, him. it's Tremont Mark. And then they just uh, make free throws down the stretch. I think they made something like eleven or fourteen, and there you go, you, you lost. But I, to me, it really comes back to when you had an opportunity, was when you went ten and a half minutes without scoring a, a field goal. They had nine free throws in that span. It felt like they weren't ever going to score again. Like that, you know, that feeling like, okay, if it doesn't happen here, when is it going to happen? Yeah. I mean, so, so basically, again, I said, hey, yeah, they scored. They got nine free throws. So he scored nine points in 10 minutes. But when you start relying on free throws that early in the game, you know, because they were in the bonus early, mm-hmm. when you rely on free throws, that, look, that's not how you win. You win that way at the end, right? What, what what did Arkansas do? They hit their free throws. Oh, yeah, the they hit a bunch of them. Well, they hit 28 to 34 for the game. And you know what? I, I believe it is. Five of those were uh, free throws to uh, finish off conventional three-point plays, mm-hmm. and then one finished off a four-point play. Just wasn't the, the – it, this stretch, after being such a good February team, mm-hmm. This team is now having a terrible February. Well, yeah, I remember writing after they beat Tennessee. That ensures that they're going to be in the NCAA tournament. Unless. Unless there's a total collapse. And, and right now total... we're seeing a – I feel like Tom Petty should be singing free fall. Free falling. You know, they're free falling. And here's the – I want to – I did some quick numbers to just illustrate how precarious their, their fading NCAA helps are. They're now 50th in the net. Now, the net's not the end-all, be-all of how you get in the tournament, but it's a good guideline, right? So they're 50. 68 teams get in. There are 20 teams that currently lead their conference, okay? So, you know, it's an automatic yep. conference. 20 teams that currently lead their conference. They, they may not win their conference tournament, but they lead their conference right now that are uh, ranked behind A&M in the net. So those teams, are, somebody in those conferences are going to get in. Yep. And then if there's any upsets along the way in the conference tournament, A and M is on a the, the, on a on a tightrope in a hurricane right now. Three game losing streak. Ninety percent of the world, except fans, are going to think they're going to lose to Tennessee, right? On the road, uh, it, it's they, they would be decided underdogs, I would think. As of today, they'd be underdogs against South Carolina. Yeah, I, I had the feeling that well, at least at home that they're going to be a tough team to beat until last night. South Carolina's better than Arkansas. I mean, even though they've struggled a little bit recently, they yeah. are. Yeah. Then well, on and on the road, they're better. I think they're better than Georgia. But I, well, how can you trust them on the road? Again, a week, a little bit more than a week ago. Now we're talking about how they had a chance to yeah. be in the mix. Not that we thought they'd be in the mix for, for the SEC crown, but they were in striking distance. They were two games out of the lead, right? I didn't think they were going to catch up, but it was at least a talking point. Now you don't know where their next win's coming. Yeah, I mean, I'm sh- I feel confident that there are a couple of wins left. A couple but, of wins doesn't get them in the but, tournament. Right, no. but, uh, but where are those? Does nine wins get them in the tournament? I don't know if it does. If you're 9-9 nine and nine in the SEC, again... Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Because for the reasons I just stated on the, these numbers, you know, there's going to be automatic qualifiers that are going to get in. If, if the, you do, you're getting in by this, the, the, the thinnest skin of your teeth margin. Everybody believes the SEC and the Big 12 are the two top uh, basketball conferences this year. And if the SEC does get nine teams in the SEC turn, or excuse me, in the NCAA tournament, then A&M as of right now is barely above water. But – doesn't feel like it. <clears throat> Again, the the numbers right now, if you're using the net as a guideline, say no. How did it happen, Ob? Like, how did this team you, a year ago? How many wins did they have in the SEC? Fifteen and three. Fifteen and three. Fifteen and three. 
with the bulk of your team, yes, they look a little different coming back. But like the alpha stars of your team coming back, your three big stars coming back, get to a point where they may not even be 500 at the end of SEC play. Yeah. Well, then you say, well, did they play over their head last year? I thought they were a good basketball team last year. I think they – you take Dexter, Dennis, and uh, Julius Marble, who I don't think – I think Julius Marble is being, at this point, hyped up better than he is or was. or in, But but you're a better team with him. There's Absolutely. no doubt. He gives you a different dimension offensively. Yeah, but if if – if you're counting on Julius Marble to solve your problems with offense and scoring, you, th- th- then you're barking up the wrong tree. No, no, no. But he's serviceable. He's serviceable, but I d- he is one guy who can play with his back to the basket, and they don't have that. He can, but – but all right, and he'll go score 21 against Florida on the right day. But right. then if you're counting on him against Penn State, he's going to score you six or eight, and you're going to get blown out because you're not – you don't have – a, a consistent inside scoring threat, and he's not a consistent no, inside scoring but I do, threat. But he I, has the ability. But you're better with him, no you're doubt. You're better with him. But I do want to say the, the Penn State thing you brought up, <clears> they stopped going to him. He was he was pretty darn good when they went to him, and then they stopped going. They became a three-point shooting team. Oh, excuse me. Well, a three-point shooting attempting team. Well, yeah, you're right. Uh, three-point shooting team. That, that doesn't say he's making. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, I – I think that's what it really comes back to, uh, and it's something we've harped on all year. They're, they're, they're just not a good shooting team. Look, I, it does me no good giving up on them. Like, yesterday there was times I was like, I don't want to watch this anymore. Like, the, But there are games left. I thought they were going to win until, until the four-point play. I thought they are going to find a way to pull this out at home, just like Arkansas pulled it out at home. And, you know, you're at the line. It's going to be a two-point game, and they're going to – and then the four-point play, and I was like, okay, this is it. I, I was wrong. I expected to see one of the best performances of the year. Oh, I thought it would. And we didn't get it. I, I, I would have lost, lost a pile of money last night. Now, would it surprise you? It wouldn't surprise me, but it would, if that makes any sense, Nunoism, that if they go out and beat Tennessee. I wouldn't be surprised because I've seen them do it, and I know they can, but that's not how they're playing right now. Yeah, and on the road, I think um, we've seen that – for whatever reason, they have problems on the road. But are, do they have the ability to beat Tennessee? Well, absolutely. They 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 ran them yeah. out of the gym here, and ever since then they've they're just not the same not the same team. Second chance points weren't there. S- what seven? They had twenty five when they played Arkansas the first time. Yeah, I think something but, like that. Um, you know, the the when you're trumpeting that you get 20 or you're leading the nation in offensive rebounds. That's kind of a dubious stat. I mean, of course, if you miss, you want to get the rebound. I get it. But that means you missed. Yeah. There's – they are just completely out of whack in this three-game slump. I hope it's only a slump. You know, I don't want to keep comparing things to football, but there's a football vibe to this whole season because of the expectations, Right. You felt, and then, and then when it starts spiraling out of control, there's no stopping it. That's what it feels like. Now, look, this team lost eight in a row a couple years ago. They, they finished very strong. God forbid they lose eight in a row this year. But um, you always look for reasons in history to, all right, well, th- they've, they've gone through adversity before. They can do this. We know what kind of player Wade Taylor is. We know what kind of player Boots Radford is. But Arkansas showed the blueprint, which they're not the only team to have done this, to really cut off any offensive game that A&M would have. Yeah, I think any team with a uh, good rim protector is going to give A&M some trouble. I also think it's easier for teams to play that way when they are either not very good or they're missing some of their guys. In this case, Arkansas had both. Because when you don't have the regulars out there that play a certain way, you can now force teams to play on both ends. You can force your players to attack you differently than you can your superstars. Yeah. Well, they were th- – that was even more alarming because I think Arkansas was out. They are out three guys? Three guys. Yeah. Not all starters, but out three guys that play. One was a starter. The Brazil's a big guy. And Musselman's a good coach. I mean, you don't have to like him. He's a good, good coach. Yeah. I, and I don't like him, but you're right. He, uh, he is a good coach, and they came up with a, a, a good – plan to stop a and but I think it's 
I mean, it's, we would have come up. It's pretty obvious. We would have come up with a plan similar to that. Everybody says try to get the ball out of Wade's hands. Send two or three guys and make somebody else score and beat you. And, and again, so much of what A and M wants to do is to attack the basket, and if you have a rim protector that can keep them from uh, getting layups, again, eight of twenty-three. Now they did a nice job early of attacking the basket and then dumping it off to guys. Yeah, Solo had a couple of nice little looks that way, but. Uh, I don't know if they got away from that or if Arkansas adjusted. I think Arkansas adjusted yeah. at the half. I do. If you want to be a part of the conversation this morning, you can do it multiple ways. You can call us up, 979-693-1150, or you can text us at that same number, 979-693-1150. It is Coffee Talk presented by Texax Coffee. Beat the hell out of the morning by going to texax.com slash coffee. Get yourself some Texax Coffee. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. That's where we find Caitlin Torn. Caitlin, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are y'all? You weren't expecting to be here. Well, you were expecting to be here, but you were thrust into the chair this morning. Yeah, thrown in here, but I've always loved to be in front of the camera. So let's do it. Good. We got some text messages in there. Yes, we do. Kevin and Brian says 10 days ago, both of the basketball teams were shoe ins for the NCAA tournament. Now it looks like both basketball teams will miss it. I, I, I mean, I know... Were the we, women ever looking like a shoe-in? No, they weren't a shoe-in, but they were trending in the right direction. Look, losing to LSU, yeah, that's, that's, that's not gonna pretty hurt. much everybody yeah. does. Um, they still have work to do, and there's time. Uh, but I, I, I think basketball, again, though, the, the big thing is the expectations. If yeah. this were a year where Boots had moved on and Wade had moved on and you're in this spot, you'd be like, all right. Yeah, you understand it. But you were just... Were they a a nine seed last year? Is that what they were? Seven. Seven seed? They were that? Okay. Seven seed last year, and you bring the nucleus of your team back. They were seven seed and angry about it. Yeah. Should have been higher. Yeah. But but again, like, all the whining, which I was a whiner, if you can't back it up, can't whine. Mm -hmm. Well, again, um, it's it's hard to put your finger on – why they not been able to uh, live up to expectation. What else we have there, Caitlin? We have a question from Louisiana that says, if the basketball team heads south from here, do you think we should move on to a new coach? If so, what do you think about Will Wade? He's successful <clears throat> oh, everywhere. That's he's OB's coached. best friend. <laughs> Will Wade. <laughs> Look, you know I, I'm not in a pos- I, I don't, we're not in a place that we're, we're going to They're not going to move on. No. I'm telling you right now, they're not going to move on. He, he's been a SEC coach of the year, what, two out of the last three years? Is that right? Uh, has he? Okay. Yeah, that might be right. Yeah. Right. Like, they're not going to, like, I understand. I understand the conversation. They're not there right now. That's not a position we're well, in. Well, here's the deal. Uh, especially if they don't get into, like she said, if it, or the, the texter said, if they're going to continue to go south, you look back and you say, all right, let, let's throw year two out because of the they didn't COVID. play February. But that's four seasons that you haven't won an NCAA tournament. You've only been game and you've been in the tournament once. You're not paying what they're paying Buzz, for yeah. the NIT. No. But at least what I believe, Jimbo Fisher is making sure that Buzz all State. these coaches yeah. have, have uh, uh, job security. But there's no athletic director. Yeah. So and until there's an athletic director. Now, a new athletic director, I would assume – I don't know. Like, Look, I would assume a new athletic director is, is going to evaluate – and let's say they hire a new AD in two months. Are they going to look for a new coach in two Maybe. months? Maybe. Ohio State did. Well, this is true. <laughs> but are they going? I don't know. Like I th- I, and, it, it, and you have to take account the last couple of years. But I don't No, I don't think that They're not there. it's going to happen. But I think, I, I think it, would be, um, it would be a legitimate discussion because of the reasons I said about four years and, and no tournament wins. If not for A and M already paying seven and a half million dollars for somebody not to coach, yeah. Well, luckily, and I say this because if we go one way, I think of the other way. Luckily, there's still games left, and there isn't a game on their schedule outside of maybe Tennessee that I don't think they should win. Now, I can also say they can lose them all because that's who they are. Well, I think they're going to be underdogs against Tennessee and South Carolina. But they can beat South Carolina. Yeah, I, I would think so. But it, it, why? there's nobody out there, they especially at home, that I don't think they, they can beat. But, but let, me, let me 
make another point to it. I don't even think they have to be at their best. They just can't be at their worst. And they've been at their worst recently. Well, I thought in the second half, especially until the last three minutes or four or five minutes, I thought they were at their worst. I thought that was the worst basketball I've mm-hmm. seen all year. Uh, their best is easy. That was Tennessee. Tennessee. They were spectacular in that they game. They were. And then it's like they used all their mojo. That's it. They're out. We've got to wait to replenish. That way. And, and it, it's starting to feel like, and I don't think that this is going to happen, but they, they, they're going to have to have another run in the SEC basketball tournament, get to the finals again, maybe even win it. I've done it before. but I will not. One year they haven't won it. but They uh, haven't won it. They've made it to the finals two years in a row. Right. And, and they've lost both. And, you know, four years ago, Buzz's first year, nobody wanted to play him going in, and then the tournament got canceled. Yeah. I, just, I was looking forward to – well, you know, with our luck, we would have gone to – Moscow for a game because we, we don't go to cool places during spring break for the NCAA tournament. We go to very frozen places or no place at all. Oh, uh, you're right. I, that's, you meant, you're, you're talking about the weather. I thought you know you were like saying, "Oh, we're going to go to Brooklyn." No, no, I, I'll take that. <laughs> New York's fun, but Des Moines. I wasn't excited about it, but it, it was actually a nice town. I actually enjoyed Des Moines when we were there. That okay. was the one. Uh, we had, so we had probably, great seafood. That we did in, have. in Des Moines. In Des Moines, which. They, they flew it from South Beach. I saw the little sign there. All right, let's hit a break. 12 under 12 time. Did you or someone you know graduate from A&M in the last 12 years? And are you leading by example in business and in service? If so, the Association of Former Students wants you to uh, nominate yourself or someone you know for the 12 under 12 Young Alumni Spotlight. Each year, the association recognizes a dozen Aggies who have graduated within the last 12 years for their business accomplishments, civic or military service, philanthropic efforts, and outstanding representation of A&M's core values, excellence, integrity, leadership, loyalty, respect, and selfless service. Previous year honorees have included leaders in business and higher education, architects, petroleum, engineers, nonprofit executives, physicians, veterans, and members of the U.S. Armed Forces. 2024 nominations close on Sunday, March 31st, so be sure to submit a nomination soon. To learn more about the recognition and submit a nomination, visit tx.ag slash 12 under 12 nominations.
It's your jam right here. Of course, he's going to take a little bit too long to get to the, the punchline here. You want to just say it? Uh, here we go. I'm free. Go ahead. Right here. Free falling. Free falling from the standings, SEC standings. It's Texas Radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We are here in the Rollo Insurance Studio, the official insurance provider of Texas Radio. The difference is real. They're an independent insurance company built around educating you on exactly what you're paying for, doing the shopping for you so that you can accomplish all of your insurance goals. They can write any form of insurance to anyone in Texas and several other states, and they've got 45 offices in the great state of Texas. Actually, they got more than that now. Headquarters is on Highway 6 right here in College Station. Go to 888-44-ROLLO or rolloinsurance.com. Let's do this, OB. We're going to have Tom Schubert in the studio in a few minutes, so we'll get back to basketball. But it should be our lead that Jace Lavalette and the Aggies continue to do what they're supposed to do. I recognize the level of opponent they've played recently, mm-hmm. but... Kaitlin Torn, how many home runs did Jace Lavalette have in all of non-conference a year ago? Last year, he had four in huh. all of non-conference. All of you, Cannon, how many home runs does Jace Lavalette have in four games? To, to my knowledge, four? No, he's five? got five. Five? He's Sorry. got five. He had two yesterday. Well, I see. I, I saw he got one, but then yeah. I got kind of busy, busy with, with basketball. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's got five. Five. That's good. Yes. That's really good. Five in, in four games. I'll, I'll take it. And he was upset if, um, I think Richard wrote the article yesterday, uh, there was a quote from him being like, he was upset about the two times he struck out. Not about the two home runs. Well, guys that hit a lot of home runs typically strike out a lot. But he, he was not happy with it. So well, yeah, You're never happy to strike. But he's a, he is a, uh, is he the most dominant athlete on, in a team sport on campus? Got to be. Got to be. I mean, he's got to be. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think who – there's a couple on the track side that are pretty well, dominant. I, can, I don't really think of track as a yep. team sport, even though, you know, you can win a team. It, it, I'm sure no. Pat Henry would, would disagree with me on that. But. He's probably listening. He's yeah. text coming in 3-2-1. No, um, he's just awesome. But he's not even, to me, the headliner. Chris Cortez is the headliner. Absolutely. Because not only does he have so much potential that we've been waiting on, Look, what he did yesterday, I'm not going to say it was remarkable. It was really good considering what his last couple of years have looked like. No walks, five and two-thirds, uh, and eight strikeouts. And he had struggled with his command before. Didn't have struggles yesterday. Chris Cortez is like those uh, wild Mustang you know, horses running all over. Yep. And you finally corral one, and you're trying to break him, you know, and, and take some of that wildness out of him. And if you can ever, you know, get that wildness out of them, you have, you know, a big old stud horse for you. If it's just he, gotta, you know, get control of his pitches. If he, if he, if that's an indication that Max Weiner has has gotten him up to get his stuff under control, then uh, he could be a big factor this year. Look, so far, Max Weiner has passed all the tests. No, I don't expect him to turn water into wine with with the pitching staff, right? Okay. But, but but they're healthy, they're better, and Bronny even said it. He goes, do you expect them to walk as many people as they walked last year, a, a, a club record or a school record? No. Okay, by default, they're going to be better. That's true. And they're already better. They're better. Like, look, long way ahead. Don't want to get too far. I get it. I get all. But we can only talk about what we've seen so far. Right. There are other programs that have struggled. I think Vanderbilt's already got two losses this year. Florida lost their first game. They got rained out the rest of the series, but they lost. Texas has already lost. Like, I'm not trying to compare. I'm just saying, so far, looks really good. Look, um, is it going to be harder to throw strikes against better hitters? Yeah, probably, because you're trying to maybe paint the corners a little bit more. But this was a team last year, pitching staff, that that had trouble throwing strikes against anybody. And they're throwing strikes now. They're throwing strikes. And let's just hope they continue to build on it. Because if if they can if, if they can just get the ball over the plate, they can get guys out and win, and, and they're gonna hit. Now there's gonna be some games where some of those bombs are gonna land on the warning track. You know, it's just yep. you, you didn't get it hundred percent. And they're gonna have to win some games. They've already kinda did that in the second game against uh McNeese. There's gonna be there's going to be some games where you're going to have to kind of win it with your pitching staff. So you need to be able to win other ways than just by going out and scoring 10 runs. But 
It is going to be really hard to pitch that team. It is. There isn't is. a hole in that lineup. You know? I'm just saying that you're not going to score nine, ten runs every time out. Sometimes you're going to have to win a, a pitcher's duel. And, uh, you know, yeah. hopefully Prager's or somebody like that's on the mound when that day comes. You know who their ninth hitter was yesterday? I'm just, I, I don't. I Ali don't. Camarillo. Who I understand had a really nice game. Reached uh, base all four times he, he went up there. A couple singles and, uh, and a couple walks. If your ninth hitter is doing that, Set yeah. up nicely for your leader, no, figure, I, right? I, I, look, I, you don't have to sell me. That's a, an awesome lineup. I'm just saying there are going to be times when Yo, you yeah. need that pitching to pull you through. And uh, so far, the early returns look pretty good. Yeah. And I understand because of other sports, people don't want to like buy all right, in. Right. Look, I don't look. I don't know how good this team. The SEC is going to be a freaking battle. Mm -hmm. You look at the top ten in, in in college baseball; half of them are from the SEC. You look at the top twenty-five; they're all over the place, right? So you're going to get some some battle wounds, and just because they do really well in Arlington in a couple of weeks does not mean oh, why wow, that's a week away, uh, ten days away. Um, doesn't mean just like when they lost a couple years ago, right? It doesn't mean anything, but for where we are, yeah. What I'm seeing with my eyes, I'm I'm I'm, I'm well, very know, pleased. If I was, if you were talking to say say Schlossnagel and he was talking about, you know, I talk to him every week. Yeah, I know you do. And he was talking about how the SEC is going to be such a grind. He said, "Man, you know, you got to go out there, you know, South Carolina, Florida, Georgia. You know, that you're gonna, uh, LSU's got to yep. go to Tennessee." And he said, "But if you're talking to a coach from LSU or Tennessee and they start doing the same thing, they're going to go and, and you know, Texas A and M. You know, look. So the point you're making is we're all making is." They they look like a really strong baseball team. They're better. They're going to be better than they were last year. Yep. And last year they were almost hosting a super regional. Almost, almost. And uh, oh, by the way, Brandon Montgomery again, another another home run. Another home. I like that guy. I do. I like him. All right, we'll hit a break. We'll come back to everyone's favorite topic, basketball. Um, maybe not everybody's favorite topic, but we got to discuss it with the coach Tom Schubert. Right now, if you're sick and tired of achy joints. Uh, I bet you are. It sucks when you can't do what you want to do and you ha hate the idea of surgery. You just kind of kind of deal with it. You shouldn't deal with it. You should call QC Kinetics right now because the state of healthcare is always changing. And luckily you have uh, QC Kinetics because the old ideas like steroids and surgery, those are no longer your only options. There's now different ways for you. And regenerative medicine is one of those top ways for you to transform your life, getting back to doing what you love to do. Non-surgical drug-free treatments that deliver lasting results and that's if you got pain in your knees your back your shoulder wherever it may be if you have arthritis or injuries out there don't let pain keep you from living the life that you want to le uh, live they use state-of-the-art treatments that harness and direct your body's natural ability to restore and repair that damaged tissue out there a revolutionary approach that can get you long-term relief with no downtime so make 2024 the year that you reclaim your mobility, reclaim your independence, walk, run, play, and live, jump rope, do whatever you want to do without the danger of trauma, of surgery, and drugs out there. No harmful drugs. Call QC Connects right now for a free consultation. Are you listening? Write down this number, 979-452-6000. QC Kinetics, 979-452-6000. That is 979-452-6000.
Texax Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. So Coach Tom Schuberth is with us here in studio, and you've got a research project for our interns. So say it out loud so somebody in the back can start researching. Hopefully we get an answer by the end of the, the, sh the show. Sure, David. I was wondering, we're shooting below 40% as a team and actually uh, 30, below 37 or 38 in conference play. I was wondering if there's an at-large team, a team that got an at-large selection in the NCAA tournament, that shot below 40% for the entire season. And in the last few years, right? Yeah, maybe the last five years. In the last see. five years. Because yeah. you basically you're trying to say, is it even doable? Because it hasn't been done, basically. Right. I'm curious. Uh, you know, I know we're elite at offensive rebounding, but I, I heard Olin earlier this morning say the reason you get a lot of offensive rebounds is because you have a lot of missed shots. You, yep. You know, you, you're a Houston guy. Uh, I always loved the story when Moses Malone played for the Rockets. You know, he won the rebounding championship over – almost every time, and then he also won the MVP twice. And yeah. he, uh, he, uh, his quote was, I want to thank all my teammates for missing Missy. those shots, yeah. all those shots. <laughs> so it's kind of funny, but it's, it's true, too. Hey, um, that brings up a personal point. Robert Reed, who used to play for the Rockets, passed away yesterday. Robert was a dear friend. He was actually at my twin's third birthday party. I uh, hate to lose him. Was a very kind man. I don't know if you ever had a chance to, to deal with him, but he was a great dude. Absolutely. I, I used to love the Houston Rockets. They had some unique individuals and, and gr great teams for sure. Bobby Joe Reed. All right, let's uh, let's do this. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center because text messages are coming in about this basketball team. All right. So if you got a question for Coach Tom, bring it in. OB and I have some questions for him. Caitlin, what do we have there at the Angry Elephant News and Social Center? Yeah, before we go onto the text group, we have a question from the YouTube chat from Sandman23. Our I would say our most loyal Longhorn supporter of Tex Ags. <laughs> He's and here daily, yeah. Every day. And he says, what were your realistic expectations for Aggie basketball this season? Realistic expectations were second round. Yeah, I those are my real. I wanted Sweet 16, but I, I thought realistic was second round. I thought it was, uh, it was realistic to think that they could uh, go get into the tournament and, and, and maybe get to the Sweet 16 again. Because, again, I'm looking at a team that, has beaten Tennessee, has beaten Iowa State, has beaten, uh, you know, uh, Kentucky, has a win over Florida, which is a, a, a quadrant one win, uh, took uh, FAU d down to the wire, took Houston down to the wire. You know, they, they were shooting free throws in the last minute to try to take the lead. Um, but I didn't see this happening. Yep. This plunge. What'd you see? I, I would have said NCAA tournament, and then to me, it's who you get a, as a draw, and then how well you're playing at the end. But I certainly felt like they were an NCAA team, and I, I still think they can be. They just have to win the right games, and and uh, uh, the one thing I think is helping us is the the quad one victories and all the quad one games we've played. Although mm -hmm. those can change, you know, as mm -hmm. you've noticed, some of the teams we have had success against or played mm -hmm. are I now mean, losing. <laughs> but uh, being in the SEC, I think they're going to give multiple teams. I think it's still eight or nine. Hopefully it's nine. My biggest fear, David, is that someone steals a bid in a Power 5 league. Right. In other words, like a team that's not going to go to the tournament gets hot and wins a Power 5 you know, conference that gets multiple bids, that's going to eliminate – somebody that's supposed to get one, and that could be Texas A&M. You mentioned the quad one wins, but I think Buzz himself on this show, if I remember correctly, even said some, sometimes the quad three losses matter more than the quad one wins. Well, uh, talking to the people that I know through college basketball, they, they punish you more for having a, low, a bad loss than a quality win mm -hmm. because they're saying if you're that good of a team, you're not going to lose to a, a three or four. Well, I know? think that was – I think that was evident last year with Texas A&M getting a seven seed. Yep. After all, everything they did in the SEC tournament, and and in the SEC, you know they were fifteen and three in the SEC, went to yep. the NC, uh, SEC tournament final, and you're a seven seed. Why? Because you lost to Wofford. Yep. What else we got, Caitlin? Yeah, we have a question from Chris in Tennessee that says. If Buzz can't win with this group in this basketball style, does he have the ability to adapt and change? How is the University of Houston putting together such a better team? Well, a couple things to, to there, and I'll let you um, follow it up, Tom. But this is we're in a new age of college sports in general that you better start adapting or there's going to be a new guard. As for Kelvin Sampson, I think he established his program 
early on as the same style as Buzz, by the way. And then with success, and they weren't in the same conference, right? They, but he, they had enough success that people started buying in. And then it didn't matter what conference they were in or who they were playing against because they were able to attract the level of player. Correct. Uh, I think uh, what you said is, is, is perfect. Um, I, Buzz is a good coach. I think the, you said the key word adjust or adapt to me is what great coaches do. You know, they find a way to win, and that's what it's about. It's not looking at analytics and defending, you know, what you do or what you don't do. It's trying to find a way to win, and that's what the elite coaches do. They adjust. So I think, um, you know, regardless of what happens this year, I know next year's a whole different season. It'll be a whole different team. I think the biggest probably disappointment from A&M people is that our expectations were high. And whether they were warranted or not, I don't know. I know we had such a great conference season. But you and I talked about that everything went right to go 15-3. and three. We yep. won every close game. We got off to a great start. We only lost three games in a road. Uh, this year we talked if we go 12-6, and six, we were going to be happy. It doesn't look like we'll be 12-6, and six, I don't think. But hopefully, it's impossible at this point. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Hopefully we could be 9-9 nine and nine or 10-8, and eight, and I think that'll still get us in. But uh, you can't have any more bad losses, and I think that would be a home loss or maybe losing even to Georgia. You know, that's, that's my opinion. To Chris's question, I would say this. Buzz showed the last two years that he could adjust. Uh, he's adjusted his offense, yep. you know. And uh, so he's made in-season adjustments. What concerns me this year is – you know, two years ago he adjusted, and a big part of his adjustment was, hey, let's gonna get the ball to Quentin Jackson, let him do Quentin Jackson things. And last year, you had Dexter Wade. Dennis and and Wade Taylor and Boots. You know, I don't know that. I'm starting to question whether he has the personnel. Well, I feel like they adjusted OB because they started going to, the, to Boots more offensively, handling mm-hmm. the rock a lot more. But if they're gonna just who, if Wade or Boots get the ball, and that's all you have. And they're going to send two or three guys at them. That's then, why I say yeah. a, a guy, a team with a, a a good rim protector is going to give A&M problems. Like Mississippi State, when Tolo Smith's down there, and, and A&M's offense seems to be predicated on being able to attack the basket and try to either get layups or draw fouls, you know, maybe that's not going to be as uh, – as conducive to winning when you've got a a really good rim protector back there unless you can get him in foul trouble Uh, because then you're kicking it out to shoot three-pointers and A&M's just not very good from there. Well, I agree with what Owen's saying. Uh, Last night, one of the best performances I've seen in this gym from a player, he's not even – it wasn't even a starter, the young man Mitchell, the big kid. He was phenomenal yesterday. He made so many plays – when you know he they used him in that short roll situation where yeah. he caught it in the middle of the lane and usually he finished them but when he didn't he kicked it out made some incredible he played plays. it great yeah. it, it was it was unbelievable and then of course mark was uh, right on as well but uh yeah i i we're having trouble scoring against really good teams that block shots i looked at the stats last night because i was curious and we're way down there in the bottom of blocking shots and there's a lot of teams in the sec florida the guys with length and athleticism uh, Arkansas is one as well, Kentucky, that block a lot of shots. And in the old days, that didn't really give you problems. But now with our team needing to score, you know, around the rim because we're not shooting the ball well, it's, it's been a huge problem for us, and we need to find something to, uh, to help that. So is the game plan to just be as physical as they can with the guards, right, and not allow any penetration? And when, and A&M's not a good enough three-point shooting team. You know, and, and to Olin's point in his column, it's amazing that they were as close as they were with as bad offensively as they were. Absolutely. Uh, we had a couple key stops. I thought, I, I was like you guys, I thought we were going to win the game, especially when we cut it to three, and then we got the offensive rebound, kicked it out the boots, and that was the, his best look all night. I thought that was going to drop. But, uh, again, I said it last week, David, if I was playing Texas A&M, and I'd like our fans to look at it. If you're playing A&M, how do you beat them? I make Boots a, a shooter, a jump shooter, yep. particularly from the three. I mean, he makes some, but I feel like you win when you make him shoot the three as a defender. And he, he has to get hot. He does, right. He, he's kind of streaky, and yeah. And uh, and so you take your chances with that. But when he's going downhill and he's able to get an angle on you and get to the basket, 
he's almost impossible to stop. He did miss a few last night that he normally makes. And then I would make Wade a driver, even though he's elite finisher on his floaters, but don't foul him. You know, where he gets you in trouble is he draws those fouls. And again, I thought he was going to get going after he uses creativity and drew a couple fouls. But those are the two things. And then try to keep Garcia off the boards. He's the most phenomenal rebounder I think we've seen in a long time in uh, A&M's uh, history of playing. All right, you do one more segment with us? Absolutely. All right, we'll hit a break here. When we come back, more with uh, Coach Tom Schubert. Right now, a moment for Caldwell Country Chevrolet, Highway 21 in Caldwell, online at caldwellcountrychevrolet.com. You go to that website to get all the deals out there. But when we're talking about buying a vehicle, you've got to talk it out the, the process with your family and, and what exactly do you want. And then you let them know they're at Caldwell Country Chevrolet because they are fantastic at talking through the entire process for you, finding the right vehicle for your family needs. They certainly have done that with multiple people here in the Brazos Valley. They did it with me. They've done it with Billy. They've done it with Bronny. They've done it with uh, R.C. Slocum. They've done it with Dante Hall. They love to help, and they'll find the right vehicle for you at the right price and the right trade-in value. And then the ser service afterwards is incredible. Complimentary pick up for all of their service customers. It's not a far drive. We're talking 15 minutes, the very edge of Bryant to the beginnings of Caldwell. Short conversation away, but you'll see the difference when you step on the lot and do business with the great people there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Highway 21 in Caldwell, online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com.
couple more minutes here with Tom Schubert on Tech Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio. Go Hour, presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. We go back to Caitlin Torn at the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. I know we got a couple more text messages for Coach Tom. Yes, we have a question from San Antonio that says, do we have to readjust our expectations for basketball instead of being an NCAA every year with an, an occasional deep run to the NIT being the annual expectation with the occasional NCAA tournament seating? I don't want to re readjust my expectations based on what the results have been. I have expectations based on what this university should be. Right. And, and yes. if you put the financial commitment that you put into basketball and you have, right, the fans do want to support a winner and they come out when there's a winner. So you better meet those expectations by winning enough to keep those fans coming. I totally agree with you, David. I'm I'm not an Aggie and I moved here six years ago. I'm impressed with Texas A&M. It's big time, you know, mm -hmm. in every aspect, in every sport. Uh, in the, the fan base, it, it's amazing. I brag to my friends. I, I played in the SEC. I coached in the SEC. And so, uh, but old school, you know, old, old SEC, not the 14 teams. But uh, I am totally amazed at what Texas A&M has. And they should be good in everything. And I think to think you should go to the NCAA tournament every year in basketball is realistic, you know, or at least – you know, four it's or five seven years. to nine. You want to be beginning. one of the best sixty-eight teams. Yeah, you know, I mean, is that is that really that big of a can you be an obstacle? Seven, the seventh best team in the SEC every year. You'll make the tournament. I mean, so I'm not asking for you know, like seventh best team in the SEC should be something that this university does routinely. I look at what other teams in our state are doing. You know, Houston, Baylor, Texas, Texas Tech, SMU, TCU, thinking. You should adjust your expectations. No, you should raise them and have and, and demand more. Yep. Tom, they're going to make the tournament. I think they are. I, okay. Just because of the the strong conference schedule prior to the uh, excuse me, non conference schedule, I do. Now, if they you got to win out at home, though, right? Absolutely, got to win the two home games, and I think we need to win one road game. And uh, I think the easiest one on paper is Georgia. I saw something last night late, though, David. I stayed up late and looked at it. Uh, I like to watch TV late. On a, uh, we're favored in every game of our last five except Tennessee on paper. Still? Also, yes, sir. Huh. You know, on that ESPN uh, yeah. ranking, even even at Ole Miss, which surprised me. Because I think that's going to be tough because I think they're going to be playing for something on that last game. Tom, thank you, sir. You're more than welcome. Thank Olin, you. Thank you, buddy. Uh, yes, sir. When we come back on Tex Ags Radio, John Harris, we'll get into a little combine talk, NFL talk, college football talk, that and more. It's Tex Ags Radio.
All right, we're back here on Tech Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. I want to remind you folks that I'm going to be with Billy at the Angry Elephant in Little Elm on Saturday, March 2nd, from 5 to 7 o'clock. So if you're in the Metroplex, you're going to come hang out with Billy and myself on Saturday, March 2nd. Aggie Baseball will be happening that afternoon. Aggie Basketball is going to be happening. We'll be watching, chatting. They're from 5 to 7 at the Angry Elephant in Little Elm. Then the Saturday after... We'll be at the Angry Elephant in Magnolia, right down the road here from Texags, about an hour away, Saturday, March 9th, from 1 to 3 o'clock. Put those on your calendar now. want to meet with a bunch of you folks that don't get the Angry Elephant here in, in town. So we'll do that. Right now, though, let's go to the uh, Brian Foley Law hotline where we find Texans sideline reporter, footballtakeover.com czar, John Harris. Johnny, good morning, buddy. Good morning, David. How you doing? I'm good, buddy. What's going on in your world? Are you getting ready for the uh, combine? Yeah, actually, uh, I just walked up uh, to my um, my guys in the film department and uh, asked them to load up my surface uh, with a few more games uh, to study before we go off to the combine. So yeah, we'll go. Uh, what's today? Today Wednesday. Yeah, we'll we fly out Monday. We'll come back Thursday. Um, we'll catch up. It's always funny because the same people we could catch up with in our building, we catch up with up there. But there are just so many other people that are up there. And you know, it's funny. I went my first year was 2015, and they had it over at Lucas Oil Stadium, and they stuck us in the West Club. And they let radio be on the outside of the West Club. And there were maybe nine teams. I mean, maybe. We sat next to the Bills and ended up striking up a friendship with the guy that was with the Bills. We've become great friends. And it started all there. But there were like nine teams. Now you go, and they moved it over to the convention center because there's so many media. And every single team sends a radio crew, a social crew, a TV crew, any and everything that you can send. It's just it, it's just bursting at the seams, uh, and it's this will this will be my tenth year going. So I think one year, yeah, we went. I think every year, maybe except for one because of COVID. So it's always good because you just feel like you know. I look at my timeline every day, and I see all the news, I see all the NFL reporters, um, you know, giving news, and then you see a tweet. And it's like, oh, man, I was standing five feet away from Ian Rappaport when he tweeted this. Yeah. You know, So you always have those kind of moments that are kind of cool. So you never know who you're going to meet um, and talk to while you're there. So it's always a fun time. Do it for three days. And um, I would love to be able to stay there through the weekend with the team and just, like, watch guys work out in the suite. But, you know, they don't like having me up there because I have a microphone in front of my face all the time. So probably not great for that uh, to be the case. Johnny, on my Facebook memories on Monday, I was going through it on the show. Um, it popped up 10 years ago. What you and I were doing, we were there at Lucas Oil uh, for Bill O'Brien's first um, combine with the Texans and also mm. uh, Johnny yeah. Manziel and Jadavian Clowney being the, the big talking points. Yeah, I missed I miss that one. You, you had a chance to go to that one. I missed that one. I actually went to the next one in 2015. Jameis Winston. And so, yeah, the, Jameis and... Um, Marcus Mariota and I just remember we were so crammed into the 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 West Club and they had three podiums and I remember this was in 2016 more so that Jared Goff talking at the same time as somebody else and the two were merging into one another like people were standing on light fixtures like trying to just get a glimpse of of Jared Goff I mean it was absolute craziness so then they moved it to the convention center there's so much more space they now have eight podiums that they send people to. And I always try and figure out, you know, they try and put the stars at the podium. So last year, they have the receivers on a Wednesday or Thursday. I can't remember what day. And so you're going through and you're like, oh, man, who got podiums? So oh, this guy did and this guy did and this guy did. And it's like they have these two or three tables that are set up down to the side. And they just put kind of their guys they don't think deserve a podium or whatever the case might be. And so I'm walking through. And I see them put a Tank Dell placard on one of the tables. And I'm like, well, that's stupid. <laughs> they didn't even give Tank his own uh, his own podium. I mean, they're giving guys that had no chance of being drafted a podium. And, it, it, I mean, it's a joke. I'm like, what are they doing, man? They have missed out on this guy. And, thankfully, the Texans were probably able to capitalize on that. But, uh, yeah, it's always kind of fun to see those kind of, those kind of things as well and see which, which players like to talk. Um, which players you could tell have gone to a good program where they've met with media repeatedly. And then you could tell some guys are just like, nope, don't want any part of this. <laughs> don't want any part of this media stuff. 
you could see him sweating up there and then it, it gets it, and I hate it for him because it becomes such a stressful anxiety filled moment when they've got all this other anxiety going on where they're meeting all these teams and talking to them. I mean, it's just, it's tough for the players. I, I give them that it's tough for the players, but for us, man, it's fun as all get out. Johnny, let's uh, talk about JJ McCarthy for a minute. I don't know where he is in your rankings for quarterbacks entering the draft, but I keep seeing people say he's popping up higher and higher. Where, where does he rank in your quarterbacks? Well, that's a good question. I've got him right now. Number four, four in my quarterback ranking now where did I put him in my Harris 100 I, I mean I'm still kind of fine tuning all that but he's fourth in my quarterback rankings um in my overall rankings I have him I think right now at 17 but I know that's probably going to change um in fact it's funny you say that I'm actually watching the Michigan Alabama Rose Bowl right now so I think that's going to change, but I also feel like the more that I read and, and listen, and, you know, it's funny when I was at the senior bowl, I, you know, talking to you know our scouts, it was like, thank God we got to deal with these quarterbacks. Like, and it didn't mean it as far as like these quarterbacks are bad. It was just, there's such a different grind that goes into a situation, a draft when you have to draft a quarterback. And one of, one of my, one of our scouts told me that in 2020, Two, he went to like 15, 16 different games um, as opposed to normally he would just go to like seven to eight. And so that was all because they were trying to get a quarterback. So it's kind of nice in a sense that you know, we don't have to deal with that. But I think with McCarthy, it's going to be kind of interesting to see how teams look at him because he's 6'3", but he's 195. You know, he's kind of a – he's not a – Big guy. That was one of the things I had a hard time kind of finding a cop on him in some sense, David, because he's not really the, the size of kind of the quarterback's team. Most of them are at least 200 pounds. And so I'm like, ah, man, I don't know if that's a problem, but you watch him. And I noticed this last year. Like I watched him at TCU game and I was like, man, he's going into his third year. He might be somebody I need to keep an eye on. Because I watch that TCU game, and even though they got beaten at TCU game, I'm like, boy, he's throwing some deep dives. Like, wow. I don't know how many quarterbacks throw. And he's known for his running. So I'm thinking, boy, if he's throwing it like this and he's got athletic skills, well, this guy's going to be, a, I think, a higher pick than people think. But then you start seeing some of the stuff this summer. Hey, J.J. McCarthy, keep an eye on him. And I'm like, well, okay, that at least satisfies what I was thinking. So I ended up with a comp for him. A smaller, healthier, and tougher Marcus Mariota. So that's what I came up with. And I always felt like what held Marcus back was what I think will make J.J. successful. J.J. is a tough dude. Marcus was one of those guys that he wasn't playing unless he was 100%. Like, he can be 99.9, whatever injury he's dealing with, like 99.9%. Not 100, he's not playing. And I remember 2018, week two, the tight, we went to go play the Titans, and he was dealing with something. I don't remember what it was. But Vrabel was under the impression that, oh, he's good enough to go. Got an hour and a half before game time. He's like, no, can't go. All of a sudden, they got to go to Blaine Gabbert. And it's like, oh, my God. And they ended up beating us somehow, um, which I thought was fascinating. But the point being, Mariota, not really somebody you could always rely on. I think McCarthy is somebody you can rely on. He's going to be very interesting. I've seen people from Minnesota that really like him. And Minnesota has, I don't even know if it's been quiet, but they have been sniffing around quarterbacks, young quarterbacks for the last couple of years. And, you know, McCarthy might be in that spot. I think Minnesota is like 12 or 13 on draft board. That might be a spot where they like, let's do it. We don't know what we're doing with Kirk. Maybe they re-sign Kirk. Maybe it's, uh, you know, I don't know how they'll figure all that out. But J.J. McCarthy is going to end up, I think, in the top 20 in this draft in some way, shape, or form. Talking to John Harris here on Tex-Ax Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. What do you think about uh, the meetings yesterday in Dallas that the CFP committee has approved, the 5 plus 7 model? I think it had to be done with what's going on with the Pac-12. Yeah, I mean, I like it. Um, I think something, invariably something comes up the first year whenever a playoff is brought up or whatever, the, you know, like the first year of the, the CFP, you know, Ohio State's controversy, you know, Ohio State got beat earlier in that year. I think it was Virginia Tech. And then they kind of played their way back in it and won the last 
No, no, they lost to Michigan too. And so, but they played their way back in it. Um, oh no, they beat Michigan. They they played their way back in it, and then they just mollywomp, just crushed Wisconsin. It was like, okay, you're in the Final Four, and there was a lot of controversy about that. So even now that we're at twelve, there will be some controversy, but it will probably be more about seeding, you know, who gets a buy, you know, top four get a buy, five through twelve. Um, we'll have to play on campus. I just like them going to 12. I like that number. I like teams getting a buy. I think teams getting rewarded for what they've done in a regular season continues to make the regular season valid. I know a lot of people are like, well, you add more teams to the playoff, the regular season's not as valid. No. If you put 12 in there, now the top four get a buy, and that is going to be worth it. Now, those top four are not going to play, which I would like to see. I would like to see the first two rounds be on campus, but I get the CFP trying to merge the the bowl or bring, you know, make sure that the bowls get a get a piece of the pie as well. I guess I get that. But man, if you think about and and David, I'd be curious, like Tech Sags, you know, listeners, and and maybe, maybe because it would be novel, I, I don't know. But would they say AM's the number one team in the country, but then they gotta play one bowl game. Then they got to play another bowl game before they even get to the national championship game. Now, I know that there's a lot of money flowing for a lot of Aggies, but that's pretty financially um, difficult yep. for a lot of fans to be able to go to one bowl game and then turn around and go to another one. And, oh, my God, they just made the national championship. Let's go to a, another one. Um, that's going to be that's gonna be tough on fans. So I'd love to see the first two rounds be on campus, but I see what they're doing. They're trying to keep the bowls relevant. Um, I don't know what's going to end up happening to the bowls that are not New Year's Day six games, but we'll you know we'll see what happens with that down the road. But I like twelve. I like the buys. I like on campus playoff games. You see it in FCS all the time. I love those. I just wish they would do the second round as well. But you know, the first year there's going to be some controversy. You know, some team gets a you know Alabama gets the four seed. Um, instead of having to play a first round game, you, you know how it goes. Um, so something like that will happen and everybody will kind of poo poo it and be like, oh, it's, oh, it's it, whatever. Um, but I, I like the structure. Um, and, you, you know, look, the Pac 12 guy, who knows the Pac 12, Pac 2, I don't know what we call it now. Um, I think eventually they'll change that 5 7 model, but I don't know. But now they, they just have to figure out whether this is something that they're doing for how, how many years they're doing this. What are they signing up for? Um, you know, length of time. You know, they got the TV contract with ESPN. You know, how, how's that going to, you know, does that solidify things? Does that settle things down in college football? I, I don't know. I feel like college football is just like an eight-year-old kid on Pop Rocks. Like, they're just hyper. There's always just movement and change and just everything going around because there's NIL, there's transfer portal. You know, there's coaches, um, you know, taking jobs. You know, Jeff Halfley leaves Boston College, which opens it up for your buddy, Bill O'Brien to be the head coach at Boston College. And, I mean, it's just crazy what's going on with college football. I think everybody in college football will be like, come on, man, let's just settle this thing down. And so maybe this with the CFP starts that. But now they got to work on the NIL, NIL stuff and just kind of get a handle on that. Um, you know, I was talking actually to a, you know, an FBS coach yesterday, and he was just telling me some of the craziness going on. I'm like, God, oh, man, holy smokes. So hopefully some of that can end up, you know, changing and just settling. So teams and programs kind of know where they are, where they need to be. You know, I don't know if there's some Premier League, you know, relegation or, you know, promotion sort of thing that could happen in college football. It's be crazy, but it'll be fun. Um, I don't know if they'll ever get to that because college football fans trying to figure that out in the South is going to be kind of like, wait a second, what? So we were in SEC, but now we're in CUSA. Like, wait a second, how did that happen? So it would be kind of fun to look at, but uh, I think that would be difficult to to put in, but you just need to settle college football down. Like, just everybody is, okay, you guys are in the Big 12? Okay, cool. You guys are in the SEC? Okay, cool. We know what the CFP is? All right, cool. Let's get a handle on NIL and calm that down and then just let this game continue to, you know, grow in a, in a positive direction. But, you know, I'm all for the players getting money. I don't, I don't want that to be I – want, I want the players to reap the benefits of their star power, of their name, image, likeness. But I also don't want this bed hopping stuff that goes on every, you know, every year just because, well, uh, well, this coach, you know, got mad at me 
And so I want to be re-recruited or, you know, my NIL. Now that this one I agree with NIL deals fall through all the time. So if it does, OK, we'll go find it, you know, go find one for yourself. But either way, just I like this as a move in the right direction to kind of sell the game down. Well, I, Charlie Baker, though, is he's OK with people transferring multiple times, Johnny. He's he's fine. Right. With it, and that, that bugs me. OK, it, it bugs me to to a degree. I just, you know, uh, who was I? Who was I talking with? I was talking with somebody about when the transfer portal was opened. There was a point at which it was open. Maybe in Lane Kiffin. There's a point in which the transfer portal was open, but the school is getting ready for a bowl game. Yeah. Like, wait, what? There's got to be a, a a better transfer portal. You go into transfer portal on January, I don't, I don't know, just pick a date, February 1st. And you have until April 1st. So you got February and March to make a decision. You can't contact outside of that. That's like that's the transfer portal, period. Done, end of story. I mean, I don't know. I also feel like maybe you know early signing day gets kind of caught in there. You got early signing day in December. Teams are getting ready for a playoff, and you got early signing day, and you got NIL kind of going up. Like, my God. I mean, that's why some of the, you know, a decent number of coaches are leaving college football because they want to get the NFL because they're like, man, it's like at least sane up there. They at least have rules of when they do things. And I think that's what college football needs. It was like they opened the NIL, uh, you know, pop, soda, Coke, whatever. Um, they opened that can and it just sprayed all over the place because they weren't quite ready for what, was going to happen, and and I get that it's it's a monumental thing. I don't mind guys transferring. I, I just, you know, they've got the one time transfer, and then they can transfer as a grad student. But when you look up, and I, I do this with my draft stuff, David. I when I put in, you know, the stuff in the database, I put in school, obviously. But what I do is I put in the name of the school they're at now, and then in parentheses I put where they came from. Well, I'm getting to where I'm putting a school. And then in parentheses, I've got another school slash another school. Like, what? I mean, I've got, you know, three schools. Like, holy cow. So I'm going through my quarterbacks right now. And in, my, in the top 10, in the top 10, I have eight that transferred at least once. Like, that's crazy. That transferred at least once. I mean, my top two quarterbacks transferred. Um you know, the only two that didn't were Drake May and J.J. McCarthy. It's like, it's weird. I don't mind them being able to transfer. I just wish that there was there was more, there were more regulations to when you can do it. And then, of course, wrapping NIL around it, you know, kind of the quote-unquote salary cap you can have for your particular team program, et cetera, and kind of make that across the board. So I think, David, they're just going to be – it's going to get to a point where the Big Ten and SEC – get together in full, and it's those two, and they block everybody else out. It's those two, and they play each other, and the champion is who's recognized as the champion at some point. And it's going to be like a, you know, like a bigger Premier League that they've got their own rules for how they do things, how they go about it. And that's the way it's done. And those are the eventually 40 teams – that are recognized in this, you know, I just think that's where it's going that can A, financially handle it, B, have the support to financially handle it, uh, and then move forward and play football at that particular level. So I think that's eventually eventually coming. Now, when that happens, I don't know, uh, next five years, potentially. The way college football is going, it feels like it'll be there tomorrow. Johnny, we got about 30 seconds left, so not a fair question to ask you this, but is there an Aggie that can really help their case a lot next week when they go to the Combine? You know, Edge Cooper, I feel like he's in a good spot. Potentially any, anybody else that you feel like can really rise the ranks? Um, I mean, obviously seeing Edge run will be fun. Um, he's got to – I mean, he plays so fast, so he's got to run well to kind of match that, and I think he will. Um, I think McKinley's got an opportunity just to show off his athleticism. Because I felt in the senior bowl, I felt like McKinley left a lot of he left a lot of good play on the sideline. Like I've seen him play better than he did at the senior bowl. And look, anybody got a bad week, you're adjusting a lot of different things. You have to do a lot of different things. But I think if McKinley goes in there and tests like I think he's going to, shows power, strength, speed, 
quickness, those kind of things. I think he can kind of regenerate the star that I think he could be in the NFL. Thank you, Johnny. Do we talk to you next week or we got to take a week off? Um, boy, TBD. That's a great. It's a great question. Yeah, let's TBD that. Uh, Wednesday will be our second full day there, so it'll just be a matter of when we get Nick Casario or Demico Ryan's. But TBD. All right, I'll text. I'd you, like buddy. to do it because I think it'll be good to kind of catch up on what the Aggies are doing. Uh, but that might be later in the week. So just TBD. Just you know, put a pin in that, and we'll see. We'll get back to it. All right, Johnny. Thank you, brother. See you, buddy. See you, man. Right now, send concrete lifting and support, 979-933-8527. Don't replace it. All you got to do is lift it, guys, and that's what they do there at Ascend Concrete Lifting and Support out there. They're locally owned, Aggie owned, uh, and they're a concrete lifting support company that is going to provide an easy, clean service at half the price of replacement. So instead of replacing your driveways, instead of replacing your sidewalks, your patio, uh, maybe your business floors, you don't need to replace it. That's very expensive. We're talking ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars right for a driveway. You don't want to do all that, right? Why don't you spend half that and lift it and it looks exactly the same. Like it feels great. You can drive on it immediately. There's no weight. It's done. Like in a couple of hours, you're back to being the driveway that you expect, the garage floor that you expect to have. They can take care of you all over the place here locally in the Brazos Valley, statewide, nationwide. Just call them up, 979-933-8527. They can raise and stabilize any form of concrete or slab. We're talking residential stuff. We're talking commercial. We're talking industrial, municipal. The phone number is 979-933-8527. You can follow them on uh, Facebook and on Instagram. It is Ascend Lift, 979-933-8527. Don't replace it. Lift it with Ascend Concrete Lifting and Support, 979-933-8527.
All right, we're back here on Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. The AM Women's Golf Team secured their third top five finish of the season. They're at the Moon Golf Invitational, and uh, Aggies tie for fifth as a team. Here, Chad Wolves are here with us to discuss it. What's up, buddy? Normally, we got some music starting out. We had music, there, you just didn't have the headphones. It could be some LL Cool J. Ah. Like Mama said, knock <laughs> you out with the. Oh, yeah, buddy. Yeah. So uh, for those who can't see it, I got popped the other day at Brazos Valley MMA, and you think my nose looks look crooked? crooked. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, like, like Ob and my my wife and my kids don't see it initially, and then if I like point at it, oh yeah, it's noticeable. I didn't see it until you turned the yeah. profile. It's uh, it adds character. And I'm going back later on tonight for a little bit more. I love it. Yeah, uh, they're good. They're good folks there. So uh, how are we feeling? Because I know you want more, yeah. But the way you all responded yesterday, I thought was great. Right? It was really good. We had a really good, um, yeah, just a talk over, kind of where we're headed. Mm-hmm. Um, the afternoon before that, we got to work cleaning up some stuff from the second round. Um, but it was really good to see signs of what we've been waiting for, and, and it wasn't a challenge. It was just um, just creating awareness to things that we can clean up, and it doesn't really. Um, involve hitting a shot a lot of times body language just demeanor just approach uh just course management stuff so um yesterday was very encouraging to um to climb up the leaderboard just a little bit and have a a a respectable finish and i think it'll be probably the toughest field that we see uh, maybe until secs well i'm looking at it cast the characters lsu auburn Vandy was number four. Uh, obviously, you all in Florida were tied for fifth. Like uh, Ole Miss, number ten. Like SEC heavy, man. I mean, we were we put, actually we had a um, just due to weather and everything else, it got crazy. We there was a day we actually didn't play golf while we were there. Um, yesterday we played in foursomes with a shotgun start, mm-hmm. and it was gosh, it was Vandy, Ole Miss, us, and Arkansas. Mm-hmm. And then behind us was like Auburn, LSU. I can't remember who was in the other group, but it was. Just a preview of what we're going to have to do when it comes April. Yeah. Um, side note, yep. I don't wear a hat often, but I wear that hat. That's like like my favorite hat. hat. Isn't that a great I hat? I love this hat. We don't have, we don't have very many uh, uniform combos that can go with this, but uh, I'll pull it out. Yeah. We nice. need a big one. Hey, uh, I do want to talk about Houston here in a minute, yeah. but Adela, just can we talk Man. a little bit about the way she played? Um, it's just uh, I, can, I can remember moments of her, her freshman year of just um just it's just really cool to see the growth Mm -hmm. um it's just a a, just a phenomenal world-class golfer but just the maturity she had off changed her body um it's it's really fun to watch her play golf um she can dominate the golf course with distance um has gotten better with the wedge and putter but man is she impressive yeah, she she's so impressive. I'm going to read a note that I saw yeah. from Brandon's notes. Mm-hmm. The program has only finished outside the top five of a tournament four times since she took over. I got to imagine you're very proud of that stat. Yeah, I think, um, you know, hopefully that's um, what we look at. Hopefully the, the tenure that I'm here is just consistency. Um, you know, getting in the final four past years is is great. It's hard to do. We've had some luck in doing that. But if we continue to have the same seasons, um, you know, September through May, um, be something to be very, very proud of. How's Blanca looking? Really good. Yeah. Um, another person who has really uh, grown up in a lot of ways. And, you know, it's interesting to see now her true spirit coming out. Um, probably dealt with some anxiety and just stuff that she was her own worst enemy. But now she's she's thriving and um, really cool to see big sister um, show lead by example. So, um, and we couldn't ask for any more from Blanca. Yeah, no, no doubt. I do want to talk about her sister, yeah. but uh, beforehand, Jenny was here in studio a couple yeah. weeks back, uh, just continuing to do great things. Doing uh, Jenny Park things. Yeah. Um, you know, Jenny, you know, the, the one thing that I would just say I've, I've reflected on Jenny's Jenny's just complete, yeah. you know, she's, um, on and off the golf course, just, just a complete person, a complete player. Um, and I say that in every sense of the word and, um, got to walk 18 with hole, 18 holes with her in the middle round and, and, and kind of trying to, she's in this little bit of a rut, which for a lot of people would love to have that rut, but, um, really we got to talk about some things and hopefully it'll get her over the hump where we'll see a lot of red numbers for her coming up. All right. So Blanca's sister is this pronounced Cayetana? Cayetana. Um, we call her Kata for short. Kata, yeah. Um, 
walk so with you, her. Did he like the accent, Cayetana? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I and Giovanna, our, our assistant coach, is uh, Hispanic too. So I don't. They laugh at me when I try. When you try. <laughs> when I try and talk Spanish, but um, you know, I got to walk 18 holes with her yesterday, and um, she shot 72, and that was about the worst that she could shoot. But we uh, once again were trying to put in a lot of things into her process that I think is going to bear a lot of fruit going forward. For her, I think the hard thing for Kata is she's, it's just crazy. She's still a freshman. Yeah. Um, but just the expectations that um, she does have high expectations for herself, and that's what makes her a world-class player. But um, it just seems like it's every shot. And, sure. um, you know, she needs to be allowed some grace, and she needs to allow herself some grace to uh, make mistakes because just her short game is phenomenal and her course management is phenomenal. So um, trying to get her to be a little bit easier on herself uh, than she has been. You all are headed to a place that I've been to many, many times, yeah. um, the Houston Golf Club, or Golf Club of Houston, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe the Houston Open was there for maybe it was a 10-year stretch. We were always there. Yep. Looking forward to being close to home oh and gosh. also being at that, at that course. Yeah, selfishly, you know, a lot of great memories there, a lot of great friends still that live around there, so it's going to be good to, to, good to hug some people around the neck and, um, and relive some memories there. We had a great uh, tournament last year, I think, set some program records, Zoe. Uh, one convincingly and um, I'm excited just to hop in the van and create yeah. some memories go up and down the road but uh, yeah it's um, we play 36 holes on Monday 18 on Tuesday we have a practice round 1130 on Sunday we'd love to see a lot of Aggies uh, in the yeah. Houston area come out and watch the girls and and see us take I'm excited for us I think we're going to play great um, based on what we saw that's a golf course that'll yield some low numbers if you really get it going so um, I'm really excited to uh to get there it's a quick turnaround but uh very very excited for for uh us to take that next step next week does the success you've had the last couple of years make it hard for a realistic season like i mean you guys you all are having a really nice start but you've yeah. also had these great years that yeah. like kind of raises the bar you know it feels different and i think that's it's it, it i wouldn't say it comes from the staff um i just think you know, it's it's it was a little heavy for a long time, mm -hmm. and it felt a little bit lighter yesterday. It felt a little bit lighter after the round on Monday. Um, you know, schedule is tough, so you know we haven't had to to have. I don't want to say be have our best performances September through, but it just had felt heavy for a while, sure. and I think that's probably the best way you could sum it up is what you said. So trying to make things lighter. It's nice to get the weather changing here and get some good practices together so we can start to see things happening at home and then it'll show up on the road. Houston Aggies listening or anybody close by, make sure you go next week there to the 26th and 27th Chevron Collegiate in, hum in Humble, I should say, not Humble, uh, Golf Club of Houston there. Make sure you head out. G, appreciate you, sir. Thank you, buddy. Thank you very Giggle. much. When we come back, Trisha Ford in studio, also having a lot of success recently. We'll chat, ch chit chat with uh, Trisha and get into your text messages and phone calls next on Tech Sacks Radio.
Trisha, you'll laugh at this. So Garrett, just a moment ago, was making fun of me. I have this little bruise on my nose from MMA class at Brazos Valley MMA. And he asked for Mama Said Knock You Out as a song. And that's what they just came back with. So, <laughs> and, and you're knocking out opponents. Welcome back to Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Perfect start for Aggie softball. Ranked in the top 25 in all four uh, recognized polls out there. How you feeling? Good. Just, yeah. you know, um, came back from beautiful San Diego and... Isn't that beautiful? Um, it, it's it's really beautiful yeah. when you win, yeah. So it was a good weekend. Um, we had some close ones. We had some ones that you know we kind of ran away with. Um, so good test for us. Yeah, and you know we talked about this with baseball earlier. It is hard to not be super excited, obviously as players and as fans and as coaches. But you got to enjoy the moment. But you also have to know it's just one part of the season. Absolutely, and and really these next two weeks we play about fifteen games and. Uh, a week and a half right. so um there's really no time but for us it's just that continual push of like let's what's aggie softball going to be you know how are we going to play um it doesn't really matter who's on the other side so enjoying it um but also there's a bigger mission ahead did i hear you correctly seven games over the next six days yeah we yeah oh the seven days um until thursday through sunday it's thursday through sunday <laughs> holy <laughs> smokes yeah. yeah so um it's all right I mean, yeah that's that's part of it well, let's talk a little bit about the start so far. Um, we can start with pitching or hitting. What it, I mean, both have been really good. What, what, what has impressed you the most so far? Um, I, I think our offense, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think we've you know, just leveled up our whole entire lineup. If you look at it from top to bottom, um, we have different areas of our lineup that's been able to contribute and help us. And so if one area is kind of struggling, you know, there's another, you know, three or four hitters that are, are helping us. And so I think from a pitching coach standpoint, I'm like, it's a nightmare because you're like, OK, I get through these couple. And then it's like, oh, there's more of them. So um, that's been good. Um, our short game has improved a lot. We have um, obviously an added bonus of some more speed. So that always just causes um, chaos. Um, so. I've been really pleased with that. You've got to be pleased with it. And also the caliber of opponent. You've been taking yeah. on some quality programs. Yeah, last weekend, this past weekend, was a good test for us. Um, you know, obviously San Diego State um, was one win away from going to the World Series mm -hmm. last year. They returned everybody. I mean, that team is is very good. Um, and if you look at who they've played, they've been in every single ball game that they've played in. Um, LMU, the Perez uh, kid, the pitcher for them, she's – um, been in every game that they played. They lost to Okie State 1-0. Um, they've, you know, beat Oregon. Um, when she's on the mound, they can compete with anybody, also a postseason team. And then, obviously, Oregon um, was also our super regional team. So this past weekend, we didn't have any let up. And our ability to be able to beat teams back-to-back -back days or twice in a weekend, I thought, was, you know, really good. All those teams made the tournament last year, and that San Diego State game, it was good for you all probably, I would assume, to navigate through some tough waters. Yeah, maybe not on my heart, but yeah. Yes. But for as a team <laughs> yes, to kind of deal with it. 100%. And have, you know, some things go our way, some things not go our way. How are you going to persevere? Um, you know, we had a couple tough calls, um, you know, not go our way, and it's like, okay, well... There was no replay. We weren't on TV. There was all these things, but I, I, I think it's good for us. I think it's good for us to go get back to the basics of how to win a ball game. Well, let's talk about a couple of players that earned SEC honors. We'll take them in parts. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Allie, who's just hammering right now. Yeah, we just leave her alone right now. <laughs> um, that kid's worked her tail off. Somebody that, um, you know, last year came in and, and really kind of learned a new system, and this year has taken off um, super strong strength. For us is is huge. Um, if you're strong, you can miss hit a ball and off the wall. So she has taken that to heart and has really worked hard. Just a wonderful athlete and really excited for her. I thought she should have gotten it the first week as yeah. well, but I'm a little biased. Of but, course, but it's um, okay. I'm gonna fight for her. Why do you think she's seen the ball so well? Uh, I think I think she's in better posture. I think um, she's understanding her swing a little bit more. So what pitches to attack. Um, I, I just think she's a better in a better headspace overall in the box. Yeah, um, we're seeing that Emily also pitching at an All-American level. Yeah, yeah. I, not surprising to me. I get to work with her every day. Um, but, man, she is fun. She is competitive. You watch her out on the field. Um, just somebody that's really excited to, to be out there competing. She wants the ball every single game. Um, our, our defense enjoys throwing behind her, you know, playing defense behind her. But just – She's fun to watch. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm looking at the stat. Tell me if this is right because our, our staff put it together. 35 strikeouts in 25.2 innings. <laughs> yes. That's pretty. Yeah. 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 I just let her, yeah, keep doing what she's doing. I almost feel like I shouldn't ask you about it, right? <laughs> like I, I can do more harm than good. Yeah. Like, I haven't looked at it. I'm going to be honest okay. with you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and how about the start Trinity Cannon has had? Yeah, Trin, I mean, she's somebody that's been a staple of this Aggie offense, you know, before we got here. But last year I felt like had started the year really, really hot and then cooled down. Um, so we addressed that. We kind of talked about some things that maybe she got away from last year at the end of the year. And, um, you know, obviously she's been concentrating a little bit more on just hitting. She's been more of our DP role. She will play some first base as well. But um, just, you know, she's a savvy senior, somebody right. that knows what this, what this is like and, and how to make, you know, things happen. Savvy senior, you, it's good to have the balance, right? Of yeah. having those seniors, but also the youth to kind of push those older players. Absolutely. And I think they both help each other. The youth kind of brings some energy mm -hmm. and pushes those seniors of like, listen, I'm on your heels. I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, and then the seniors also, like they don't, they know they've been there, they've done that. Um, and so they can kind of help them along. So we have a really good balance. I think if you look at us top to bottom, of you know some youth, um, some juniors, obviously, but um, also some some young ones. Another name that our our fans are definitely aware of is Julia. Just uh, her start. <laughs> Yeah, Jules is special. Um, you know, I, I talked to her about, like, she gets herself out, and, and that's really our biggest challenge with her is she almost has too good of hand-eye coordination and puts uh, the, the bat on the ball even when she shouldn't. You know, most don't. So really with her, um, just trying to get her to – shrink that zone a little bit in the batter's box she gets anxious she wants to help her team um but i do love the fact fun story um the game against um oregon on sunday coach harger told her hey i want you to go out there and um this last at bat i want you to change the game and so she did like she took a daddy hack that yeah. first um first pitch and they went back with the same um, pitch and it's like with well, Julie you can't do that like you got to go to a different zone and they went back up there again and she made them play so that was pretty fun are you pleased defensively yeah absolutely I mean, on our infield we've had so many more assists this year if you look at our stats our outfield has had Allie Enright has had a couple of assists we just were our ability to have four short stops in the infield and be able to play catch it's been one of the most comfortable feelings I've ever had as a coach of just allowing our infield to do what they do and be athletic Help us uh, with the layout. So you got southeastern Louisiana Thursday. Yes. A one, two. It's a, it's a, yeah, it was one on Thursday, yeah. two on um, Friday, two on Saturday, one on Sunday, and then we play Sam Houston on Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the, this weekend is kind of cool. We have an alumni event. It's our alumni recognition weekend because Jennifer McFalls is the head coach at Kansas. Kansas yeah. She's an Aggie. So she'll throw out the first pitch on Saturday. I haven't let her know this yet. I usually uh -oh. wait. Yeah. Because, you know, we all don't want to have attention. But we have North Dakota State twice, St. Thomas, and then UT UTSA. Great group of teams coming. Great, uh, yeah. it, it'll be fun for the fans to come out too to see some old stars. Absolutely, and um, the twelfth man our opening weekend was rocking. Um, yeah. I love Davis Diamond. I love the twelfth man. So let's get him back out there again. We're gonna have good weather. Heck yeah, we, we need the good weather after. <laughs> And then just to, to cross sports for a moment, how cool is it that both Diamond Sports right now are having the start that they're having? Yeah, Jim is awesome. Um, we, we have a really good relationship. I'm super happy. I could tell we, we did a little tour um, together in the fall that he was pretty excited about the group that he had yeah. put together. And so um, I was hoping last night to catch some – some part of the game I watch it in my office but hopefully in the next couple of weeks I'll be able to get out and see them play in person but just a, a wonderful human and somebody that I'm really happy that's leading our baseball program fans and analysts love to have you know predictions of what we expect and these expectations as a coach I, I know you have expectations but it really does boil down to what we're doing like you have to micromanage the season right yeah, we, we don't really um, – I'm very much like that. We don't talk a lot about goals. Um, we obviously have standards and how we want to play the game, but we don't, we're not a program that's like, okay, we're going to um, go into this weekend, we got to at least go four and four, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Really, um, I, we don't pay attention to what's on the other side. It's about us and being able to execute our game plan. And so um, – I think our chances are good when we do that, and, and also um, us being able to deal with adversity, right? So when things don't go our way, are we able to kind of bounce back and, and, and rebound from it? Trisha, thank you very much.
Thanks so much. Good luck to you, and uh, hopefully we'll come away with what, six. Wait, six by Sunday, and then seventh by Tuesday. Yes. <laughs> Goodness gracious. But that's that's life, right? It's life in the softball. That's yep. what you do. All right. Right now we're taking a little break, but before we do that, let's talk Heritage Films. That's Chance McLean's company. They make documentary films about normal people. So your neighbor, your dad, your uncle, your family business, your family ranch. Chance can make a documentary about that entire situation, and he'll do it just like a Netflix, HBO, A and E style documentary. He does it for normal people. He did it for my father. He's done it for many Aggies out there because Aggies love to tell their story. Make sure you reach out the chance to get a documentary done real soon because uh, you are not promised tomorrow and those stories, you don't want them to go away, right? We play the game of telephone when it comes to our family stories. Your dad tells you the story, you try to tell your kids it, and then you start losing the details. With a heritage film, you've got it for the next generation and the generation after that. They also have the year flix option, which is great. 20-minute Q&A video, more reserved for the youngers in the family, right? You talk about their freshman year of high school. You can talk about their junior year. Maybe we'll talk about their freshman year at A&M, and then when they get their Aggie ring, make it a four-part series. Really cool stuff that Chance does. The phone number is 713-893-8341, 713-893-8341. Heritage Films, yourheritagefilm.com. That is yourheritagefilm.com.
Estamos aquí, Tech Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Nick Savage in studio with me because, Nick, uh, usually I check in with you early in the morning, but the, this last few days, and even a little bit last week, you've been training folks to do your job so yeah. they can replace you one day. Yeah, exactly. I, I've said it from the get-go. I'm basically rendering myself useless, uh, so I'm sure I'll be out the door here um, sooner, sooner rather than later, but no, I guess buddy. it's got to be done. With, if know, I want to celebrate my wedding, I guess I have to do it. You need to have somebody there ready to roll. Uh, I do want to say this. So I, I brought it up earlier, so there's no confusion. We are doing a Q&A at the Angry Elephant, uh, the one in Little Elm, which is on March 2nd, 2024, five, obviously, 5 to 7 o'clock there in Little Elm, right by Frisco. I was told six miles away, according to Mr. Google. And then in Magnolia on Saturday, March 9th, 1 to 3 p.m. It is not a show. It's a Q&A. So we're, we're not broadcasting from there. We're just going to hang out. You know, watch some Aggie sports, and uh, Billy will be there. I'll be there. We'll be chit-chatting. So if you're in the Metroplex there for the Little Elm location, we'd love to see you that day and hang out at the Angry Elephant. If you're um, in northern Houston area, in the Magnolia, Tomball, Conroe area, come hang out with us there at the Magnolia. What I know that people have been reaching out to you. We're not doing a show, but yeah. we will, we'll be chit-chatting there. I won't be there. Just the cool people, you and Billy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't think Bronny will be there. He'll be actually at the baseball game. Did I say he was cool? Is he not? You know he's coming up in like four or five That's minutes. Fine. I'll say it to his face. Hey, I'm going to read this text message, okay? okay. And I'm, I'm already going to tell you the answer is no, but I'm going to read it out loud. Adam in College Station. Am I the only one who doesn't want Aggie basketball to get in the tournament? The tournament should be a reward for an entire season or at least a good run. Yes, they've had a couple of big wins, but overall the season doesn't merit a term, tournament berth. They have no identity. They have no clear second option. Their primary, well, that's not true. Their primary plan is taken away, and they seem to, uh, on most nights, incapable of adjustment. That doesn't seem to me like a tournament team, and I don't think they should be rewarded for the season they've had. Luckily, the season doesn't end today. Yeah. There's still time. And I say that because that's the reality. Like, are they trending in a direction to make the tournament? No, they're no. trending in the wrong direction. Absolutely. They've run out of lifelines. They, are, they, I, they don't have to necessarily win out, but they, they got to start winning more than they're losing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if they get to nine wins, if, and that means they would have to, like, keep winning. Right? Yeah. If they get to nine wins, uh, do they make the tournament? Probably. If nine teams from the SEC are expected to get in, they will. Um, I'm of the opinion they were robbed in 2021. So let's say they don't deserve it this year, which I think that that case is still to be determined. They owe us one. So get us in. Well, I, I think that text is a little contradictory because he said, oh, that it doesn't matter what they did. But he mentions they had some big wins earlier on in the season. And yeah, they, what, three games skid, not good. But like you mentioned, couple of I think every game from here on out is either a quad one or quad two and that really starts to matter right now oh look you didn't have to put me on the big screen hey, guys but is. uh I mean I at the moment I think they deserve to be in again it's, it's just going to depend on on how they finish out I think you know are they one it, of the 68 best teams in the country I'd say yes yes I would agree all, all the metrics say they right. are uh, are they losing right now at the worst time? And yes. there's a chance that they lose four straight? Yes, I get it. Uh, but if you look at the totality of the season, if they are a 10 or a 9-win team, which right now I don't think they're going to be, right? Like right now I have my doubts. I'm with you. But I have my doubts because of the way they're playing right now. This team absolutely has a chance to beat South Carolina at home. Can they beat Tennessee on the road? Well, they've beaten Tennessee already. Can they just be a little bit, like, they don't have to be 20 points better than Tennessee. If they're two yeah, points better, one point exactly. better, they win. Yep. They just haven't shown that. And I'm hoping, we talk about the counters, Coach Tom Schubert was in the studio. All right, they take out Wade Taylor as an option. They can't take out both Wade and Boots, mm -hmm. right? So if they do, what do you do offensively to get going? I think that means you got to feed Henry Coleman the ball more. Yep. you gotta, you got to give him the space to to. to I move think Andy back. has that ability, too. And he's not the scorer, correct? But he can score. Yeah, right. And a, a year ago, I would have not said that. All right, let's hit a break here. Thank you, buddy. Have fun at the Fifty Cent concert at the uh, Houston Rodeo. Well, I did go to Alicia Keys. Yeah, yeah. I like I like music. I like Fifty Cent. All right, uh, we're gonna go in the club next here on Texas Radio with Ryan Broniger. Do a little recruiting country, maybe mix in some baseball. That and more Texas Radio.
All right, we're back here on Tech Sags Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. It's time for Recruiting Country, presented by Caprock Health System, a faster patient center revolution in care with two ERs in the Bryan College Station area. You've got the original 24-hour ER in South College Station on William D. Fitch and the full-service hospital with ER in Bryan on Briarcrest. You can find them online at caprockhealthsystem.com. We've got Ryan Broninger in studio. What's up, buddy? Good morning. You've got the uh, AC set on icicle mode, and I love it. Well, it was like 89. It's usually, yeah, it's usually set on cremate when I come in here. You know, I don't touch it. I, I very rarely touch it. I just walk in and do my work, and I deal you with just, it. You just, you're in whatever weather, you're a professional. No, I wouldn't say I'm a professional, but I just, I just, I don't think about it until it's too late. And then I think about it, and Nick is standing there, or somebody else is, and I'm like, hey, can you change it? Have you had a workout partner this week? I have not. Oh, okay. I don't think I've had a workout partner I've missed in months. Out. Okay, so he's probably moved on from you. No, he wants me to give him some some workouts. Oh, well. But like, Do you have any confidence that those workouts, whatever kind of time you put into putting a program together for him, that they'll be adhered to? No, but I, <laughs> let me say this about our, our friend. I, I won't say who it is. Our friend. I give him credit because he is consistent about going. Sure. The one thing that I kind of struggle with, there's a couple things, but one thing I struggle Don't with. Don't sugarcoat it. No, just this is what I struggle with. I'm sure I'm going to get it back later. What I struggle <laughs> with is like, I, I'll do this, but I won't do that. And I'll do this, but I won't do that. And you cost an injury here because you made me do this. And I know my body better, so I'm doing that. So there's that. Well, yeah, that same partner will come in there with me, and I have a set regimen. I'm doing these this exercise for this amount of sets with a very regimented rest period between sets. Um, he gets a little distracted, and so the rest periods, I think, fluctuate. But, sure. again, we should give him credit for being in He's there. He's consistent, dude. He like, he works hard. And like, there was a time when I was working here that our workout partner would not go to the gym, and now he's gotten to be where something he enjoys doing. So that's a huge positive step uh, in overall health, and just I would imagine if you ask our partner uh, his life. Are you, um, do you find yourself to be approachable at the gym? I, I, I think so. I mean, doing what we do, there are a lot of people, and it's not, I'm not faulting these people, but they believe that they know us because they hear us all the time or they yeah. read us on the side. And, well, that means we're doing a good job if they know right. us, right? And so it, it's not uncommon for us to be stopped at the gym to talk about work stuff. That's pretty common. But I would like to think that I'm approachable anytime. But, good. you know, I'm a big guy, but I'm, I'm a pretty – Pretty big softy, I think, or at least, you know, in most settings. I, I don't think I'm not approachable, but I am usually, like, when I'm at the gym, I'm pretty f focused is probably the right word. But I'm always, like, I'm, I love talking. You're a big phone guy at the gym. But, I, but I'm not, like, texting on the gym. I, am, I, I have an app that I update my, oh, my okay. workout, and I'll show it to you. And it, there's detailed <laughs> notes, buddy. Detailed notes. Well, it's, it's, that's less psycho than you writing them all down from the early 2000s. Well, I, well, I, I did write them down <laughs> up until a year ago to like, move to this app, the RP Hypertrophy app that I use. Okay. All right, should we get into – because I, I know there's a fragment of our audience that just said, just get to the recruiting already, bro. DeAndre the Tiger. Is it ridden? Is that how you write it? Uh, yeah. It's, that was actually one. I had very lim limited interactions with Tiger, as I do with most DFW kids. Mm -hmm. I interviewed him once when he came into town, and we set something up here in the studio. I did a full interview with him, went back there to cut it and edit it, and didn't hit record to start the interview. Oh, I remember that. That's so, right. Uh, but in that – interaction and just kind of being around his parents and stuff like that. I was like, you know what? Like, I don't know anything about this kid. Jason will know everything about these DFW kids. I don't know much about him, but he just gives me a pretty good vibe that he really yeah. likes Texas A&M. And that was during last football season. Um, so you fast forward through the coaching change and Jason talked about in our in-home visit, how much keeping Tony Gerard Eddy on staff really helped close this deal for Texas A&M because throughout the coaching transition, one thing that was consistent coming out of Tigers camp was that they wanted Tony to have a role on the staff just because I, I do believe that they were really fond of A&M and liked the idea of their son playing at Texas A&M. But his dad told Jason, man, if they could keep Tony Gerard Eddy on staff, that would go a long way in, in the transition for us from one staff to another. And, and they did that, and they gave him an on-field coaching role. And by all accounts, Tony Gerard Eddy has been killing it on the recruiting front, not with just the help with Tiger Riding, but 
kind of reestablish helping re- A&M reestablish themselves in Dallas uh, and also along the defensive line his position uh, in those recruiting battles that he, that he's got going on there just we've heard nothing but great things about Tony early in his coaching career so that's very encouraging uh, for a first year head coach and similarly it's not the same but it's similar whenever Elijah came in we just didn't know much about Elijah as right. a coach and as a recruiter I think the AF fan base probably knew more about Tony because he played here sure. and played with Vaughn and Garrick Miller and that DeSoto pipeline that opened up with him. But I also believe that they're getting we're going to get a much better taste of him as a, a fully rounded, like a, his full arsenal as a coach and recruiter throughout this recruiting cycle. But the early returns have been very encouraging uh, for TJE. That – and I just think that A&M has done such a good job. We've spoken a lot about the organization of these visits, how structured they are, as getting as much face time as possible with Colin Klein and Trooper Taylor, who deserves a tremendous amount of credit with this. Obviously, Mike Elko. The credit can be shared here, but I don't think there's one coach over there that's going to have so much of an ego and say, no, I landed this guy. I think right. together, like this was a – to go along with Kelvion Riggins and Dejon Petaway, like these are big lands as a staff, not for one particular coach. Obviously, big deal for Trooper Taylor. It's his first uh, commitment as an A&M coach back in the state of Texas where he's from. So it, it's a landmark commitment for him. But I think even Trooper would tell you, I didn't do all the work on this thing. It was a conglomeration of all of us. So to see the coaching staff working together to – kind of knock off some of their top targets at a multitude of positions. Like I said, linebacker with Kelvion Riggins, cornerback with Dejon Petaway. Both of those guys ranked at or right or at the, near the top of their wish list going into this cycle. Must have guys at these positions. Jason and I are in the middle of breaking down where we kind of feel like their big board sits. I mean, obviously, we don't know the everyday ins and outs right. and every nook and cranny of the big board, but just from piece – recruiting long-form articles and trying to write about as many of their top targets as, as we perceive that they have. And you got to sit there and go, man, that, they're in a pretty good spot for like their must-haves, their need-to-win recruiting battles. They're in a really good spot heading into the spring. Now, nobody is going to care if A&M led for Keati Armstrong in March. Right. But if they end up signing Keati Armstrong, then you can start to say, well, they really kind of got the ball rolling early in the spring. So this, the coaching and recruiting staff is eager to hit the ground running and make some some headway and really cause some ripple effects and some waves, which is what Tiger Ryden has done. First of all, sensational player. Like, you can look at him and go every down back. I actually had a buddy of mine that reached out and texted me. He's like, does he kind of remind you of Ben Molina a little bit? And uh-huh. I was like, yeah, I can see there's some Ben Molina in there. It's a better version, I think, right now than Ben Molina. But he's got some jump cut ability, not a necessarily pull away from you guy, but will run through contact, will eat up 10, 12, 15 yards at a time, but also like kind of an underrated, shifty player. And Jason talks about his willingness to be a pass blocker, his willingness to be a receiver out of the backfield. Two other things that we, th- we saw Ben Molina be pretty exceptional at during his time at Texas A&M. So I think he's a better version of Ben Molina, but you're talking about a South Dallas kid much like Ben was that comes to Texas A&M has a chance to impact this football team in multiple years without question. I think Tiger Rodden uh, is that, and there's he's got a real argument to be the top back in the state of Texas this cycle. So how important do you think the DFW area is to Coach Elko in, in moving forward? Oh, it's massively important, and we've written about that. we talked about it. It's, it's something that had to happen, and there's no reason in going back into why – their presence had suffered and and waned as much as it had under the last staff. But when Elko got here, that was just the situation they were in, and it had to be remedied. Like, that was one of my big points, like what he has to do. There's some things that he can take his time with. Um, one of the things he had to do was repair the damage that was done with the Texas high school coaches. Done that. And the next thing was almost right after that was – re-energize their presence in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. And when you're looking at Kelvion Riggins, you're looking at Tiger Ryden, and you're looking at some of the other top, top players that are now uh, emerging as real candidates to become part of this Texas A&M class that are in the Metroplex area, like they're, they're doing that. And they're spending time up there. They're allocating resources up there. And for now, you'd have to say that it's paying off. And 
one thing about Tiger and one thing about Kelvion is they are very influential kids in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. All those kids know them. The analysts know them. The other trainers know them. Like, they're very popular kids. Obviously very good players, but very well known amongst the top community or the community of top players in the area uh, in North Texas. And that should go a long way. Like, those can be two real pod pipers for Mike Elko in the Metroplex going forward. So back to uh, Tiger for a moment. You talked about he's a sensational player. Um, and OB and you and others have always said, like, you, you can tell what kind of quality player is by the teams that are the programs that are going after him. This was a guy that a lot of people were after. A lot of people were after, and he's also at one of the top programs in the country, yeah. and DeSoto was a, the, a feature player. I know he, had, he dealt with some injuries as a junior, but I think he only missed three games. But a premier player – on one of the best high school football teams this state has ever seen. I don't know if you've gone back and look at what DeSoto did this past season. I mean, they blitzed everybody, just blew the doors off of people, and he was one of the key cogs to that team. And I believe they finished maybe like in the top three nationally. Max Preps does their high school yep. team ranks. I believe DeSoto was a top three nationally ahead of Duncanville, who Duncanville won a state title. DeSoto beat them during the regular season. So this is not only a kid that comes from a premier program, he was a premier player at a premier program and a program in DeSoto that has a longstanding history of not only sending guys to the next level, but when they get there, they're players. So they don't have this kind of checkered history of some of their guys work out, some of them don't, or they very rarely do programs out of uh, kids out of DeSoto work at the next level. Like their hit rate is pretty high. So we've talked Dallas. We'll talk Houston in a minute. But what about outside the state of Texas? Jimbo loved to go to the Northeast. And he, he does Coach Elko have plans to continue expanding that footprint? Yeah, and we're gonna we're writing about some of those kids right now. Jason just released his article yesterday and talked about two linebackers, one from uh, California and Noah McHale, and one from uh, La Cueva High School in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is not a state that Texas A&M is typically recruited by the name of Mason Pola, who is also a fantastic wrestler like legitimately could have olympic wrestling in his future so how he balances that with football will be interesting to see throughout his recruitment but mikhail and pola are two linebacker targets that jay bateman has taken a real interest in in terms of national there's obviously a very talented group of in-state players and you've got one committed in kelvion riggins but you know that and that's just one position when you're looking at linebacker at new mexico and, and one in california uh, they're doing a great job with a tight end in the state of Kansas named Lincoln Cure, which when's the last time A&M signed anybody from the heartland, like one of the top right. players in the heartland? That can be directly attributed to Colin Klein coming here. So this coaching staff, as with any new coaching staff, they're going to have backgrounds with different areas of the country. Holman Wiggins, obviously, in the southeast. Trooper Taylor in the state of Texas. They're, you know Patrick Doherty and some of those guys coming from the east coast. Mike Elko and his background in that area. So – they've done a pretty good job of mapping out the entire country and, and really scouring it. But as Jason and I have said, and we said it yesterday in our in-home visit, we believe the vast majority of this class is going to come from within inside the borders of the state of Texas. I can see it so much. So if it's a 25 man class, you could legitimately go 12 DFW, 10 Houston, three from out of state. It may not be exactly that, but I think the in-state numbers are going to greatly outweigh the out-of-state numbers. If you got a question for Ronnie, you can do it uh, by texting the show, 979-693-1150, 979-693-1150. All right, so you wrote something. Uh, you had a post on Houston, and Houston's always been good to A&M. Just uh, talk a little bit about the momentum and, and how their efforts not only are being spread out, but they still know where a lot of the talent they get from. Yeah, what's going to be interesting – for me, mostly in the city of Houston, is like who gets the big pushes? You know, they've got a lot of offers out throughout the city. Uh, and where do they go to make their big pushes for certain players? You know, is it at cornerback? Obviously, with Dejon Petaway committed, they've got a huge target still out there in Devin Sanchez at mm -hmm. North Shore, but he's committed to Ohio State. He is going to get the full court, full court press until he signs somewhere else. Like, that's not a kid that ain't the same staff's going to give up on. But after that, you know, Caleb Chester has an offer at Fort Bend Marshall. Cade Phillips at Fort Bend Hightower. Cortland Guillory at Klein Oak. You go out the, through the city, Dorian Brew at Conroe. Like, where else 
in the city do they go and make their big pushes? That's going to be something that we don't know right now, but it's some, going to be something to track. You can say the same thing at wide receiver. Kelshawn Johnson at Hitchcock. Ja'Cory Watson at Shadow Creek. Tanook Hines at Spring to Caney. Quan LX at, at the Woodlands. You know, there's just – you go on and on. Katie, uh, Andrew Marsh at Katie Jordan. There are all these names and, like, just who is going to get the big nudges from this coaching staff. And, and look, even though all those guys have offers – they're, the coaching staff is still combing through tape and they're watching seven on seven stuff and they're watching, you know, they're talking to people on these campuses about character. So there's still f- a lot f- more evals to do, further evaluating to do on the kids that already hold offers. So that's one thing in the city of Houston I'm really going to be tracking is like, where do they really go? They've, they've, they sent a lot of offers out, but who's really going to get the big nudge. And this is where that all happens, right? They, they, they do their evaluations. They see the seven-on-sevens, and they and they have a hunch, but this is where they can help, help solidify that direction. Yeah, that, when they get out and start going to these campuses in person, right? Mm-hmm. And you can bring kids in at a junior day, and you can eyeball them from a physicality standpoint, and you start to get to know them from a personality standpoint, but you don't get to see them do any football stuff. So when they go – to these campus visits, they get to see them do real football things with their own eyes. And so maybe they like the kid on tape, and when they see him in person and he's in the squat rack and you know he's got good depth to his squat and he's explosive and he's really flexible in his hips, they're going, wow, I, I didn't know he could do that. So we go from liking him to loving him. So there's a lot of those evals still to do as well. Before we hit a break, uh, talk to me about Ja'Cory Watson. He's a, a name that you're following. Yeah, Shadow Creek kid who's – the thing with Ja'Cory is there's zero question about him in terms of playmaking ability with the ball in his hands. Like, it's electricity on tape. The question that you ask about Ja'Cory is he just hasn't played a lot of receiver due to team need. He's played quarterback. Now, that has never been – that has never been something that should negate a kid from – being highly sought after as a receiver prospect, right? We've seen a lot of quarterbacks or a lot of great wide receivers play quarterback in high school. One of the best receivers ever to play here, Terrence Murphy, was a quarterback in high school. So that's not an eliminating factor for a kid. But it does, like, you just kind of, if you're making evals, like, man, I just would like to see him do more stuff on tape at receiver. That's where seven-on-seven can help, going to these camps uh, throughout the circuit, throughout the spring, the camp circuit will help if he puts stuff on tape there. Uh, I know that Jacory is working with some of the top trainers in the state on his route running ability. So, <clears throat> again, I don't think it's something that's going to necessarily hold him back. But I do think folks are going, okay, like we really like the playmaking right. ability. Where can we find video? What can we do to see him more as a receiver? I didn't know this, but Brad Butler, who's an Aggie, by the way, retired. So yes. he's no longer the coach at Shadow They just Creek. promoted one of the assistants. Yeah, the I'm looking coach. at it right now. Yeah. Tyrone Green, um, yes. who was uh, his assistant there. So. It's a really good job, Shadow Creek. They got a lot of players. And Brad built that from the ground up. I mean, right, it was a brand new school. Yep. Got a, and got a state championship for it. Heck yeah, they yeah. did. Great guy, too. I love Brad. All right, let's hit a break here. We'll come back more with uh, Bronny. Right now, Millican Reserve Time, Farm to Table Community. They're in College Station. They got homes. They got trails. They got wide open spaces with a mission to build a healthy community around nature. And they've done that by trading lightly on that land that Millican Reserve can be found on, creating a sanctuary for family, for nature, and for community. They've got 2,600 acres of open space. You've got farms, you've got 30 miles of trails, and you've got homes out there. They connect families to nature and to each other through an extensive network of trails throughout a wooded landscape that includes walking and equestrian paths, creeks and ponds, and gathering areas. They're committed to maintaining and restoring that natural habitat. Uh, They have uh, all the native species you can imagine out there in those preserved woods, ponds, and creeks. They got white-tailed deer, they got sombers, they got rabbits, they got turtles. And homeowners there at Millican Reserve share a legacy of conservation, which means generation after generation you'll come back to that uh, pristine countryside place and you can go reflect there you can go explore there and you can do it all hiking biking canoeing you name it kayaking equestrian trails the evening yoga the summer camps the music festivals they have it all there at Millican Reserve find out more information at the website millicanreserve.com that is millicanreserve.com
little Ryan Bingham for you. It's Tech Sags Radio presented by David Garner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Uh, go to the text line. Uh, J 1984 says, uh, Ryan, you're really good on the call. I think you truly know baseball. Great listen. Uh, day, day, day three of just props for the Bronster. <laughs> Well, I pre- I certainly appreciate it, but I thought you were gonna have a recruiting text for me. No, 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 nobody. They're all about baseball right now. I'll be uh, I'll be back on the call Friday and Saturday this weekend. Well, we'll be listening for that. I do want to read this note. I didn't do it in the opening part of the show. I should have. Nick uh, wrote down some notes about Chris Cortez. Obviously, he pitched five and two thirds, two runs, six hits, eight strikeouts, no walks. In 2023, Cortez only had two appearances where he didn't allow a walk. Only one outing where he threw at least five innings and walked one or less, and he averaged 2.1 walks per appearance. It was very encouraging. Much like everything else that's happened for Aggie baseball so far, it's all been really encouraging. Uh, if you want to nitpick some some areas, you can. Like the, the infield defense, for instance, when Chris was on the mound, he had a couple of tough luck hits, some really mm-hmm. soft contact. Uh, he had a, a ball that bounced off the plate really high, and then it hit the ground and, and spun away from Jackson Appel, which couldn't do anything about that. Uh, he had a really soft ground ball, hit through the middle uh, that Caden Kent couldn't come up with. Caden will probably tell you he should have made that play. Um, you know, Blake Benderup had a ball that was a really tough hop that, again, Blake will probably tell you he should have made that play. But overall, I thought Chris was outstanding, showed a real feel for the strike zone higher than he's ever – higher than he's ever shown us in his career at Texas A&M. Yep. Uh, that should probably be accredited to Max Wiener. Like, I don't, I don't have to go back and look. I don't know that he got to a three-ball count last night. If he did, <clears throat> excuse me, if he did, there was very, very, very few, like one or two. So just that in and of itself uh, should be a really positive sign for Chris's development going forward. I thought the break and stuff – had better shape. Uh, I thought he had better feel for it. Yep. The changeup has always been ahead of the slider, uh, but I thought last night they were about equal in terms of their effectiveness. And look, <clears throat> I know it's a mid-major program in Incarnate Word. They were pretty physical. Like when you looked at their lineup and they had a, a bunch of guys that came from Power 5 programs, uh, their four-hole hitter was a kid that Nolan Kane and Jim Sloshnagel had recruited in the past. So – like, they weren't <clears throat> completely void of talent. And they made Chris pay for a few mistakes, but he was also, like, they, like, he'd give up the cheap hit, and then the next pitch was a strike. He gave up a double. The next pitch is a strike. Like, there's competitiveness to it. There's belief to it. And there's also now pitch feel and pitch shape and a much more cohesive plan for how Chris is going to get guys out. Did you know last year – <clears throat> or he has completely ditched his four seam fastball. Two three ball counts, according to Nick. Two three ball counts. So yep. very few. He has completely ditched his four seam fastball. Last year he was throwing something that was kind of in between a four seam and a two seam that he thought was a two seam, a four seam, excuse me. But the numbers, the analytics showed otherwise. So this is where Coach Wiener's kind of his incentive and his want to dive into the numbers to come up with the best pitch shape and what does the analytics say? He's got a formula. I didn't know this until talking to a former player last night. Max Wiener's got a formula that will spit out a pitch effectiveness based on the numbers that come up on the rap soda or on the track man machine. So he can look at all of it and it'll spit out an effectiveness. He goes, okay, what if we tinker with this does that effectiveness number go up? Mm. So there is just a lot more technology to it and a lot more data-driven analysis, data-driven changes. Like, And Chris has to be able to accept those changes, right? His whole life, he's been done nothing but grip it and rip it, and I throw harder than everybody else. But he, So he has got to take a step back and go, okay, like everybody throws hard now. Like, How do I get guys out more? So you've got to swallow a little bit of your pride and swallow a little bit of what you've been in your past and be willing to change. And I think that Coach Max went in there instead of telling Chris, like, hey, you've got this huge explosive stuff, we go, oh, let's really look at the stuff. Sure. How can we make it better? Instead of just looking at what the radar gun says, look at the whole – map out the whole equation, and it, if it comes down to that one number, let's see if we can tinker with some things to make that, that effectiveness number go up. It's pretty cool to, like – I'm not a pitching guy – 
But to hear all the stuff that goes into this stuff, and then whenever the kids get out to the mound, the only thing, like you hear Max just say simple phrases. He doesn't talk about thumb placement to enhance inverted break on, his, on a changeup or uh, you know stride length that may help the spin rate on a breaking ball. That's all the stuff that they do in the bullpen. When they go out to the mound and it's game live bullets going, he's like very, very simple. See it and throw it. That's one of his favorites. Just see it and throw it. So envision yourself making the pitch and do it. Like just he cuts it all down when they go to game. And through the first four contests, you'd have to say that it's been extremely effective. For the baseball fan who maybe doesn't understand it the way you do, you, you kind of alluded to the nine hole earlier. Like they have some options there. Those options have paid through. Paid off. Well, Ali Camarillo has been fantastic to start the season offensively and you heard Jim Schlossnagel say in his post game that whenever he got to Texas A&M in the fall, he could not hit a ball to right field. So much like Chris Cortez listens to coaching, takes it, and, and adapts it to his game or adapts his game with these improvements, there, it's no different with Ali Camarillo with Michael Early. And there's been a ton of work put in with Ali's swing, his approach, his setup. And now not only is he homered to right, and he's getting hits to right field and, and homering to right field. Uh, so he's off to a really nice start, uh, about as good as you could hope for uh, for him. And, and kind of, you know, there are some trepidations when these guys go to a level up, like, you know, can I do it here? And obviously the, the competition's going to improve throughout the course of the season, especially, you know, when they go to Arlington and then into SEC play. But to to have this base level confidence be built with some of these guys, is going I think it's going to be proved to be very important uh, early on in the conference, excuse me, early on in the conference season. Awesome, Brian. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, when we come back on Texas Radio, a little more baseball. Kendall Rogers from D1 Baseball. That and more. It's Texas Radio.
Tech Sags Radio presented by David Garner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Got a media member in Houston trying to call me for me to confirm that Kyle Field is going to be the place for uh, a, uh, not a and excuse me, Brazil versus Mexico and, and soccer. If if I'll confirm it when I put it out there. How about that? And then you can look at my tweet and have that as as confirmation. I've seen the reports out there. It'd be cool to see a hundred and whatever thousand go watch that. Um, unfortunately, I won't be around that weekend, and hopefully the Aggies are in the Super Regional that weekend. Um, I think that's Super Regional. I think that is. June 8th is the reports about that. Don't know where uh, Kendall Rogers is from D1 Baseball. He's uh, busy, so we'll try to get him here before the end of the show. If not, whatever. It happens. Uh, if you want to be part of the conversation, you can do it at 979-693-1150, 979-693-1150. I saw this tweet. I want to go to it. Um, where did it go? It was about um, the uh, the expected records in college football, and I can't find. Here it is. Jake Wim, who's a uh, program director, but also works on. Uh, I believe it works with SEC Mike. He says projected twenty twenty four records for college football. He's got the Texas Longhorns at twelve and zero. He's got Georgia and Ole Miss at eleven and one. By the way, that means that Georgia goes to Austin and loses to the University of Texas, according to this man that you'd be wondering, why do we care about his opinion? Because opinions are out there and we discuss them. And then it's, uh, so can I see Georgia and Ole Miss both being 11-1? Absolutely. They've got Tennessee at 10-2. and two. I'm not understanding the Tennessee love. I just, I mean, I think they'll be fine. I don't, I don't understand this. Uh, love that a lot of people have for them just because I haven't seen the quarterback play much Nico like uh, I just I got to see more right like you can't just automatically assume but okay nine and three for these four programs I'm going to tell you four programs at nine and three all right number one is LSU Oklahoma at nine and three I don't see that being the case Auburn at nine and three I don't see that being the case Okay, whatever. And Texas A&M at 9-3. and three. I also don't see that being the case. I mean, I do. Let me rephrase that. For A&M, I can see 9-3. and three. I can see 10-2. and two. I can see 8-4. and four. I don't know. There's Again, I think we've talked about it before on the show, but we are in a world of college football that is almost impossible to know how teams are going to do now because of the chemistry and the changes and the revolving doors. Nick is back with us as we tap dance our way to the uh, 1050 segment. I'm looking at this like Nick and I'm, I'm like, people have to have these hot sports takes. They have to be like, I think this team's going to do this. Like the Texas angle. Yeah, no shot. 12 and 0, that's wild. Look, do I think that they go to Ann Arbor and beat Michigan? As of today, I would say yes. Yes. Okay. Do I, uh, but I I think people are forgetting Georgia's lost like one game in like how many years? Yeah. Two and a half years. Like, they're not losing much this year either, I don't think. I mean, well, they, they are losing an All-American tight end, right? So True. there is that. But, I mean, when you're at the level of Georgia and what Alabama has been, you lose players, you, re, you replenish pretty quickly, right? Yep. So, uh, but A&M being at 9-3, I appreciate that. I don't know how all these – like, I haven't done the math on how all these things would work out for all these teams to be 9-3 and three that play each other because A&M yeah. does play – LSU, A and M does play Auburn, right? Um, they obviously play Texas, so they they have they have A and M losing to Texas in that scenario. They've got Alabama at eight and four, and Missouri at eight and four. Missouri, I'm more sold on them than others because of what they just did this past year. Mm-hmm. Bam, I can understand the eight and four conversation. I don't know. Uh, that's, that seems a little sharp for them. I, again, I, it's not Nick Saban anymore, but it's still. Kaylin I can DeBoer. understand it. I uh, I could understand like a nine and three, but eight and four just seems like a way too sharp of a drop off for that program. But but again, we'll see. Yeah. Um. And then these rest of them from just Jake Wim guy. Uh, Kentucky at six and six. Mississippi State at six and six. Um, looks like South Carolina four and eight, and uh, Arkansas Vandy at three and nine, and Florida at uh, two and ten. So look. Again, I don't know how you can make a real educated opinion. Um, do I think A and M can go nine and three next year? Absolutely. Do I think um, we got Kendall? We do have Kendall. Help, uh, what's his name, real quick? So don't bring him on you, here yet. You forgot, you forgot his name, Dawson? Dawson. Matthew Dawson. Yeah. All right. Uh, again, these are just opinions. 
things happen and whatever. Let's do this. Let's go to the hotline where we can find our friend Kendall Rogers from D1 Baseball here on Tex Ags Radio. Kendall, good morning, buddy. How are you? Preseason form. I had my phone on silent on an accident. So sorry about that. All good, buddy. All good. Let's uh let's start let's do a lot of Aggie baseball here in the next ten minutes. Um pitching yeah, man. Chris Cortez, if they get anything similar to what they got yesterday from Chris Cortez, this team is gonna be pretty darn dangerous. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we talked about that in the preseason right right here on the show that I thought that Chris Cortez would come an X factor for this team because obviously, you know, Prager threw really well over the weekend. Um, you know, they, they've got really good options on the mound. But, you know, it, to be an elite team, you need your elite players playing at a very high level. And, and clearly, uh, you know, the, the arm's electric. The arm was electric last time. I was actually talking to a staff member on UIW who was like, man, it was like that dude looked really good last night. But, you know, beyond the stuff, the, the biggest stat for me was the zero loss. I mean, this is a guy that in the fall, you know, when I saw him, uh, the command was way better. And I'm kind of, okay, it's fall baseball. We'll see if he does it in the spring. But he goes out there his first outing of the spring and shows immaculate command. And I'll tell you what, if he can command his slider and his fastball, he's going to have a big year, and I think that's going to end up meaning great things for A&M. Talking to Kendall Rogers here on Tech Sags Radio. Kendall, you mentioned Ryan Prager, but if they get that from Prager, I mean, the, the whole staff so far has yeah. been really good. But if they get that from Prager a, a, as an ace, I mean, talk about a couple different options that they have. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, I, I was a little surprised going into the weekend that Sadeo uh, got a weekend start. But, I mean, obviously he threw pretty well. Uh, to allow one run uh, on the weekend is incredibly impressive. But, you know, Prager, you know, as a freshman before he got hurt, he showed kind of flashes of this. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was a low 90s fastball, typically 89-92. It was really good uh, off-speed stuff. He, he really commanded his own well. The thing I like about him, and, and, and honestly, and it's from watching his interview with, I think it was Bronny on, on Tech Drag. It might have been you. I can't remember who it was. Uh, but I was watching an interview with him, and, like, man, I just love his demeanor. Like, he's very mature, uh, seems to have a very level-headed head on him, uh, very articulate. And I, I just uh, – he, he sounds like a guy that, beyond his stuff, is just a really good makeup guy. And that's a, that's a great player to have as your Friday night starter uh, in the SEC. Talking to Kendall Rogers here on Tech Tags Radio. All right. Let's talk Jace because, I mean, we knew he was going to have a good year, right? I mean, we all expected it, and, and it's just a, a part of it. But, like, to, for, he had four home runs in non-conference last year. He's got five already. Yeah, dude, it's, it's crazy, man. Like, this is kind of what I expected from Jace Lavalette. I don't know if five, I don't know if five home runs in four games is exactly what I expected. But, I mean, I, I think I said coming I mean, when we talked about it before the season, I thought he would hit 25 to 30 home runs this year. Uh, and, and that and that's looking like a very good prediction right now. And, you know, he's going to slow down at some point. But the thing about him that's so impressive is, you know, I was talking to somebody that scouted him in high school, and they were telling me that, that it's funny to kind of watch him hit now because they were like, he was not a very competent hitter in high school. Like, he, you know, very often kind of questioned himself a little bit, did not look very confident, took a lot of pitches at times in high school and then swung and miss a lot. And, I mean, he could not be further from that at A&M. Uh, he's aggressive in the zone. He lays off, and, he's, and I would say all the time, but he's done a better job of laying off bad pitches. And, man, every single time he makes contact, uh, it's violent. I, I think somebody call, called him the violence on uh, Twitter. I kind of love that, that name for him because Literally everything off his bat looks very violent, and I absolutely love it out of a player like that. I want to do want to ask one more uh, offensive question because you look at some of the uh, the transfers and how sure. they're fitting in, and you've got Braden who's got a couple of home runs, doing exactly what we wanted to see from him. Uh, Ali Camarillo's looked great, especially in the nine hole. Teddy Burton yesterday goes the long ball. Just talk about the transfers and their impact offensively. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Kim Rio is a guy that, you know, I, I think we talked about this a few weeks ago, but, I mean, if you could get 280, 280 290 out of him with a little bit of power production, uh, I think you'd be excited. Uh, and, and he's on track to potentially do way better than that this year. So that's a positive. Uh, you know, Montgomery, you know, he's, he's going to be a guy that throughout the year is going to have some, you know, uh, swing and miss. But, uh, you know, for, for the most part, he's going to be a, a big-time power hitter in the middle of that lineup. He, you know, he's a guy that, you know, I was kind of laughing uh, over the weekend. 
uh, you know, in, in like the 10 minutes I was able to watch any of the weekend because they go live, uh, you know, them walking Lavalette to get to Braden Montgomery. I was like, boy, I said, if teams are going to do that all year long, uh, A&M's about to have a really good year. So, uh, yeah, man, I just, uh, I'm a big fan of, of those guys. And, you know, Ted Burton, uh, I thought he was a kind of an underrated transfer, to be honest with you. You know, he had a really good year at Michigan last year. Again, an older guy who's seen a lot of it back in college baseball, obviously has a good frame on him. And so, yeah, I, I'm not surprised that he's having a, you know, off to a good start. But uh, so far, so good for A&M. I, you know, I don't think McNeese and UIW are, are world beaters. But I'll tell you what, uh, on the mound for A&M, uh, I mean, they, they weren't throwing strikes against uh, McNeese State last year. So, we'll, you know, that's a, that's a big positive for me. Kendall, uh, you surprised about the start Vandy's had? A couple losses early on already. Yeah, the problem with Vanderbilt is, you know, Carter Holton looks like he might be banged up again. They're, they're really kind of slow playing him a little bit. Grayson Carter, um, you know, of the, the 99 with his fastball, but the command is very iffy, very Cortez-esque from last year. Uh, and he struggled in his Friday night start. So the problem Vandy has is they have a, they have a bridal potential in the mound. But just offensively, outside of guys like Jonathan Fastine, uh, they just don't have, a, they, they don't have a balanced, powerful offensive lineup. So they're, they're going to have to pitch at a very high level, and they haven't done that so far this year. So Vandy's margin for error, uh, even though they look really good on paper, is very small compared to teams like A&M, uh, LSU, and, and Florida, and, and clubs like that. And, and let's talk about LSU because perfect start, a couple of really yeah. close games, and then that 27-run outburst. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, LSU is going to be a really interesting team as the season progresses. I mean, obviously, I don't think they're going to be that offensive uh, as they were in the last game all year long. But, you know, uh, when we when we kind of broke down the SEC, we talked about Grahovic at A&M, and we talked about Jake Brown at, at LSU as two freshmen to watch. And, you know, uh, Jake Brown had a huge weekend for the Tigers. I think he hit like 6, 620, 630, something like that over the weekend for LSU. So, uh, obviously, he's off to a great start. You know, I love what they have, you know, behind the plate. You know, Luke Holman threw well for them. Uh, ironically enough, they did have some walk, uh, walk issues with a couple of guys over the weekend. Uh, you know, since, uh, since uh, you know, Yeski moving over to LSU. So that's kind of interesting. But uh, for the most part, I mean, they played pretty well. Kendall, uh, last thing for you. I don't know if you saw this. I found this on my notes uh, this morning, and it was just interesting. There was a Sacramento State player that was hit eight times <laughs> in nine plate appearances. Did you see that? I did eight times in, in nine plate appearances. I want to say he got hit again last night. I, I have to double check that. But, you know, beyond that, the crazy stat of the week, actually two crazy stats of the weekend, and you'll have to fact check me on this last one. But Duke hit 11 home runs in one game over the weekend. Duke, by the way, looking very good. The last one is, I, 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 an Indian fan posted this. I, I'm, I'm questioning whether or not it's true. But the one run over the weekend, the, the least amount of runs in a weekend since 1918, is that accurate? I don't know, but it sounds accurate. Somebody tweeted that. I didn't realize they actually had three-game series back in 1918. <laughs> well, well, I it, need somebody to check that. I had a few a fans tweeting out about that, and I was like, wait, 1918? So – that, that's a fact check job for somebody at PA today. Well, regardless, we know it's it's, it's got to be in the top two or three weekends ever to start. Hey, buddy, appreciate your yeah, time. One one run in a weekend is awesome. Yeah, you got it. We'll talk to you next week, man. Ken Thanks, Rogers. David. Appreciate it, buddy. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, buddy. Uh, D1 uh, Baseball with the series delay. Hello, Kendall. Hello, David. All right, Troubadour Festival time. Uh, Texas Barbecue and Music Experience. They return to Aggie Park here coming up real soon, Saturday, May the 18th. And this year's event is bigger and better. It's awesome. they got some great names out there. You'll want to uh, check it out. The Troubadour Festival is bringing you 35 of the best barbecue joints in Texas for you to indulge in unlimited samples of that incredible smoke creation. And you can't forget about the music because they got legends on the stage all day, great acts all over the place, including this year's headliner, Travis Tritt, that music icon. He'll be joined by Texas country legend Pat Green, as well as William Clark Green, the Red Clay Strays, Cameron Sackey Band, and much, much more. Whether you want to experience the barbecue and the concert, or just a concert, or just a barbecue, there's a ticket for you. Tickets are now on sale at Troubadour.com. Festival.com. That is troubadourfestival.com. 
Get yours now. We'll see you at Aggie Park. Again, it is TroubadourFestival.com. Go check it out. It's coming up very soon here in May. All right, friends, time to end the day with Double Dave's caller number 12979-693-1150. We're going to hook you up with your choice of a dozen pepperoni rolls or a large one-topping pizza from Double Dave's serving Aggieland since 1984, serving up that favorite pizza and world-famous pepperoni rolls with reliable in-house delivery, bringing piping hot goodness straight to your door. Just click on DoubleDave's.com, and your favorites are on their way. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. A little tired, but I'm, I'm excited to be here. Ethan Jones with us to uh, give us some stats that he always likes to break down for us here on the program, and you're giving us a great start to baseball. Yeah, I didn't want to talk about basketball, so I want to talk about baseball, some positive. I like being positive on this show. Um, and we've Sometimes had a- you're not positive. Okay. I, re- I remember football stats sometimes. Well, see, when there's just football, you got to go like true. But when there's two options, I'm going to choose the positive Okay, one. there we go. Um, but with baseball, great start to the season, like you said. We've outscored our opponents 40-4 to four through the first four games. Pitching's been great. Hitting's been great. Um, and one of the most impressive things is like when you compare the first two seasons of the Sloss era, like the start of the seasons, to this start of the season, this start has been so much better. Uh, specifically when you compare the stats of the first four games of the 2024 season to the average stats of the first four games of the 2022 and 2023 season. Give it to me. 2024 stands out as impressive. Um, let's start with batting comparisons. 2024. 11.8 hits per game, 2022 and 2023 through the first four games, 8.6. Home runs, 2.8 2024, 2022 and 2023, 1.3. RBIs, 9.5. 
versus 7.3. Batting average, 356 versus 270. That's significantly that's higher. Really, that's really big time. In 2024, we've had scored four, 40 runs in the first four games. The other two seasons, we averaged 32 runs over the first four games. 20 extra base, base hits, 2024 f- versus 14. One thing we have been a little worse at is we've struck out more, but that's okay. Let's go now to pitching. Well, and that was kind of expected. Um, Ronnie did talk about the, the propensity for this team to potentially strike yeah, out. Yeah, it's, but it's not a big – it's only two more strikeouts per game. It's not a big difference. Um, when you go to the pitching comparison, hits allowed, 5.3 in 2024. 2022 and 2023, 7.1 hits allowed. 2024, one run versus 3.1. ERA, 0.53 versus two. 0.93 walks 1.8 versus 2.8 and I remember last season walks was one of like the biggest things yep. we had 4.9 overall in 2023 and only having 1.8 right now is big time the pitchers are under control but also they're striking out the batters more 11.8 versus 8.6 also we've arrived to zero home runs so far this season I'll take that we got about a minute left what, do we, what else do we have okay let's look at some national rankings we've been really good in the SEC we rank third in the SEC with a 356 batting average we have a 689 slugging percentage, second the SEC. We rank second the SEC in home runs, 11 through four games. Also pitching, we have the best ERA in the SEC with a .53 ERA. We've allowed our opponents to only have a 171 batting average, fifth in the SEC, and I've struck out our opponents 50, 47 times, which is fourth. We've only allowed seven walk, walks, which is first. Um, we also have the best strikeout to walk ratio, which is a 6.71, and then also Jace Lavalette has been great. Ranks third in the SEC with a slugging percentage of 1.23. First with five home runs. And first in the SEC with 21 total bases. I don't know this for a fact, but I, I would assume, because I looked yesterday before the game, four was the league leader in all of college baseball. So at five, he, if yeah, he's he, not number one, he's in the top two or three. Yeah, he's leading. I'm pretty sure he's leading the nation, too. Yep. Um, thank you, buddy. Good yeah, stuff. We got, got it all you. in. Yeah, we did. That was impressive. Good job, Ethan. Thank you. All right, so tomorrow on the program, it's a Thursday, which means more schloss. Zane will be here for that. Uh, we'll have Aaron Torres. We'll have Stephen McGee. We'll have Logan Lee. We got to do talk. We do got to talk basketball. And everyone's favorite happy show, the fan show. That and, of course, your text messages. Thanks so much for watching and listening. We will see you mañana.